This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after ten is the time. A very good morning to you, Boris Johnson, to give evidence at the UK COVID inquiry today. Um, That will get underway shortly. We're not taking it live, but we will be keeping a very, very close eye on proceedings and bringing you any developments as and when they occur. What we will not be doing is taking editorial lines being punted at Boris Johnson's request by right-wing newspapers this morning and allowing the most egregious liar ever to hold the highest office in the land to somehow preempt the investigations of the inquiry. I read one article that said, friends say he will be concentrating on policy, not personality. And you think, is there anybody in the entire editorial structure at Rupert Murdoch's empire, prepared simply to point out he'll be bloody well doing what the inquiry tell him to do, regardless of what his friends may say or whatever client journalists may recycle on his behalf. Is there a German word for being shocked but not surprised? Is, is there, a, is there a, a, a way to describe it? You sort of think you've reached saturation points at how awful this man is and how completely he's polluted public discourse and politics in this country. And then up he pops again from a position of complete and abject disgrace, considered to be too awful even for the awful cabinet that he appointed. And up he pops again now, calling in favours from The Telegraph, The Times, The Sun and various useful idiots in broadcast media to, to allow him to attempt to manipulate the coverage of something that hasn't even happened yet. It is frankly extraordinary and yet at the same time so utterly and ploddingly predictable. I, 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 I retain the ability, it turns out, to be shocked even as I am not remotely surprised. Covid inquiries should look at harms of lockdowns. Front page of the Daily Telegraph. Covid inquiries should look at how many deaths Boris Johnson is personally responsible for. And it hopefully will. So we'll be keeping an eye on that story. Um, And it has now begun to unfold. Um, I'd like to see him try some of his usual shenanigans with Hugo Keith KC. It may be a rather enjoyable um, uh, spectacle for as long as you can remember that we're actually talking about decisions and incompetences that led to all manner of suffering up to and including death, avoidable and unnecessary death. Six minutes after 10 is the time. Right, something really weird happened on the programme yesterday. And you don't see this, I don't think. Although, remember, you can actually watch the show now in its entirety on YouTube, which is a, um, a, a, a curious, a curious addendum to the business as usual, but I I don't know if you could tell if you watched it yesterday that I was exchanging expressions with the producer of the programme because I was reassuring you that there's no way this new £38,700 threshold for um, uh, bringing a spouse into the country or having a spouse in the country, there's no way I said to you that it could possibly be retrospective. And the producer, who is a more cynical soul than me, was raising her eyebrows at me and sort of pursing her lips and shaking her head as if to say, I wouldn't be surprised, I wouldn't put it past them. And me, James O. Brexit, the sworn enemy of all things uh, post-Brexit Tory, the sworn enemy of all the, all the client journalism, all the appalling politics, all the promotion and inflation of epic incompetence and, and, and dishonesty. I was going, no, 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 they wouldn't be that awful. And I was actually reassuring you that if you are currently together with a joint income of less than £38,700, if, for example, you're managing to raise a family with one of you staying at home to look after the children and one of you earning £38,500 a year, I reassured you yesterday that you would be fine. And I'm really sorry I was wrong. It, It has been confirmed subsequently, and I bring you this news if you haven't heard it already with a genuinely heavy heart it is one of those mornings where i can't quite believe what has happened to my country and once again i find myself stunned that i am contemplating uh, catastrophe inflicted on, on my country catastrophe and callousness inflicted on my country by people who claim to be patriotic never have the words of, of dr johnson on that issue rung more true 
The last refuge of a scoundrel, he called it. And I never understood what he meant as a kid. I always thought, what's he on about? Patriotism's a good thing. It's good to be patriotic. But people who trumpet their patriotism and use it as a camouflage for their ca ca catastrophic conduct and their callousness, they are scoundrels. They are scumbags, to use a more modern phrase. And people claiming to be patriots, whether it's Nigel Farage with his, his grubby saloon bar xenophobia, or whether it's Boris Johnson with his self-serving narcissistic instant gratification, they are the people responsible for, for bringing our country close to its knees. And... It's Rishi Sunak's turn this week to do something that I consider to be profoundly un-British. To do something that I consider to be oddly, and, and I think that Alicia Keynes used this word last night with Andrew Marr. It's profoundly unconservative. And, and, and I speak when I say that of an ideology that recognises aspiration and that recognises the importance of family. It might not be something that you agree with. I certainly don't join in the demonization of single parents in the way that many right-wingers do. But I, I do recognize, the just from my own personal experience, the wealth that family can deliver, the non-financial wealth. I read a great interview with Rosamund Pike, who's in a wonderful new film called Saltburn, and she, she was talking a little bit about privilege. It's an interview in GQ. It's another great article in GQ. They've got Martin Freeman, Ralph Innocent, and Stephen Merchant together to talk about the last ever office. You remember the Christmas special when Dawn and... Uh, what's Martin Freeman's character called? Tim. When Dawn and Tim finally get it together. It's just a beautiful, one of the best episodes of television ever seen. And GQ's got a wonderful article about it. And it led me to this Rosamund Pike interview. And she talks about privilege. And once she... Think one of the things she said is, I was privileged. I had love. You can get love from one parent or two parents or four parents, whatever it may be. But love, it's there. Love um, is a privilege. And so family is important. And it used to be something that conservatives cared about. And yet now they are introducing policies designed to appease racists that will tear families apart. I think... I think they will tear families apart because the first thing we must do together is, is look at what the current situation is and what the detail may be. And how interesting is it that even we're not entirely sure, unless you've actually had to live it or jump through the hoops or whatever it may be, even we're not entirely sure what the current rules are. So if you have a foreign partner and if your household does not earn £38,700... Or if, of course, you are a foreign partner who does not have indefinite leave to remain, then you could be thrown out of the country next time your visa comes up for renewal. I can't believe I'm saying these words. This, this, isn't, this isn't who we are, is it? I'm going to have to say it again. If, if, if your partner is foreign, or if you are foreign with a British partner then if you don't earn £38,700 a year which is more than the national average for an individual not for a household to be fair but if your household doesn't earn more than £38,700 a year then when your visa comes up for renewal you could be thrown out of the country so that politicians who will almost certainly not be in power when the figures come in can claim that the reduction in overall numbers of net migration are somehow good news. It doesn't even address, of course, the people coming here. It simply seeks to throw people out so you can subtract them from the overall total of people coming in and deliver a net migration figure that is, they hope, 300,000 humans lower than the one that they delivered after 13 and a half years. Actually, it's not quite right, is it, given the year that the stats refer to. 12 years in power. I'm sorry. I, you know, I genuinely wasn't expecting to be overtaken by emotion this morning, partly because we covered it yesterday, Partly because I've been a little bit distracted by limbering up for Boris Johnson's evidence, which is underway now with a, an apology not worth the chip paper that it's printed on. 
and partly because the full impact of what I've just said to you hadn't hit me until I actually said it out loud. Brits, this is how the Independent newspaper reports it, Brits could see their foreign partners told to leave the country the next time their visa comes up for renewal if their household does not earn £38,700, number 10 said. They choose at the Independent to describe it thus. New laws designed to slash the number of migrants by 300,000 a year risk splitting up families already living in the UK. This is joint income. This is for people already here. Uh, if, if it's someone coming here, then the host partner, as it were, needs to be earning that independently. That needs to be single income. So it's a little bit of confusion there, but I promise you this is... Um, this is this is the the bottom line. This is this is the the, the final say, if you like. This is currently definitive. Thirty eight thousand seven hundred pounds joint income. When you come to renew your visa, if you're below that figure, you risk being thrown out of the country. And you know they talk about case by case bases. They talk about. Um, uh, 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 having to uh, uh, put your case forward to uh, get some sort of exemption from, from the overall rule. But this, I think, puts us in an almost unique position as a, as a civilised, wealthy nation. Indeed, um, uh, the spokeswoman Madeleine Sumption, the director of the Migration Observatory at the University of Oxford, said that this makes the UK an outlier among Western nations. People living here. This is a punishment for British people earning less than £38,700 a year. The punishment is this. Your husband can't stay. Your wife can't stay. I can't... I, I'm really sorry. This doesn't happen to me very often. I can't actually believe what I'm telling you this morning. Some days you really can't see the wood for the trees, can you? James Cleverley, who often speaks movingly of his mother's arrival in this country to, cha to train as a midwife... Um responsible for this policy i don't want to ask you this question actually but i'm going to have to th th this affects you right oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three this affects you what are you going to do what are you going to do and listen let's not get immediately entrenched in emotion the idea that you could have a joint income of of less than £20,000 and just to coin a phrase or to indulge a little cliche, you could then avail yourself of all the um, uh, benefits of living in Britain. I don't, I don't just mean obvious state benefits. I, I can see why some people would be uncomfortable with that. You should, of course, be considerably more uncomfortable with the epic wealth, the untracked wealth and often untaxed wealth of the kind of people that promote Boris Johnson's cause at every opportunity. But but I can see how we as a nation, you could make a strong case for saying we can't afford to support people um, who, who weren't born here or, or aren't from here or, when a household income, you're coming in to join a household with an income below £20,000. Um so the leap from 18,000 to 38,700, it may be the size of the leap that is the problem rather than the necessity of some sort of leap. But, but we are where we are. Um, I'm only going to say this once more because I'm getting quite a lot of texts. The, the, the people we're talking about are the people that already live here. And the joint income you will have to have in order to stay is 38700 If your partner doesn't currently live here and you want to bring him or her here, then that will need to be your independent income, a single income of 38700 But if you're applying for a visa, reapplying for a visa, then that figure will be household income rather than... Um, rather than uh, uh, independent income. So if you want to bring a spouse to the UK, you will have to earn £38,700, a significant increase on the current figure. We talked to some people in that position 
uh, yesterday. But if you are already in the UK as a as a non-Brit with not who doesn't have indefinite leave to remain, then the household will need to earn thirty eight thousand seven hundred. I want to make that clear because I, I understand the confusion. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need. Is this you? That's the first question I've got. Is this you? Tell me about you. Tell me about your family. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about your income, if you, if you don't mind. I don't want to be rude or, or nosy, but to work out whether this is as evil, and I use that word rarely, to work out whether this is as evil as it appears, we need to know a little bit more detail. Maybe it's reasonable. I, I, I can't pretend that I get by on 38700 pounds a year if, if you earn less than that maybe it's perfectly reasonable that you are only allowed to pick your partner from a pool of people that were either born here or have indefinite leave to remain here unlike anybody earning thirty eight thousand seven hundred and one pounds if you fall in love with somebody born overseas you can't be together for the sake of 50p you can't be with the person that you fell in love with on holiday yesterday we heard from a chap who'd fallen in love with a Brazilian, a chap who'd fallen in love with a Malaysian, a chap who, I mean, and this, of course, will apply to Europe as well. You might have fallen in love with a Frenchman, but you earn £38,699 a year, so he can't come and join you in this country. But the people I'm most interested in this morning are, are the people who are already here. I can't quite believe what we're seeing. And you know, yesterday, we didn't really find anyone who thought it was a good idea I don't include um, Billy the Bulldog avatars on social media, Billy Buncher numbers. I, I don't include little Tommy Ten Names fans who are just sort of desperately begging for attention by pretending to be hard on social media. I mean real people, real people with real blood in their veins who are cheering this. They don't really seem to exist, but maybe, maybe I've just managed to... Uh, detoxify my feed so completely that I just don't see it anymore. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. It's 20 past 10. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 23 minutes after 10. I am a mental health first aider at work. I've just had to spend the past two hours trying to help calm a colleague that has had multiple panic attacks caused by worry about this disgusting evil policy. He has a partner and a newborn and is terrified of what the future holds. I want to be able to tell him that it will be okay, but I can't. This is performative cruelty at its absolute worst. I, is, he, is it? I mean, is it just incompetence? Have they cobbled together a policy without really thinking it through? I hate the fact that, that I was wrong yesterday. Not, not because I hate being wrong, but because I hate what being right means. It means that couples currently together in this country, I don't think you can deport someone with children. I mean, but then again, the, the first thing they do is talk about the Human Rights Act being abolished, although they seem to be stepping back from that at the moment. It is, I think this is one of the darkest days we've ever shared together. This, uh, the, the problem when poli populism and policy collide is that populism involves demonising immigrants, demonising foreigners, demonising the other. The most important phrase we have stumbled across on this programme in the context of immigration is, I didn't mean you. It's such a powerful phrase. It's such a powerful illustration of how it all works. I didn't mean you. Because all of the people who think that they want <clears throat> more control or take back our borders or send them back where they came from, they generally, and there will be exceptions to this, they generally don't mean the people that they actually know and encounter. Well, I don't mean my doctor. I don't mean the nurses. I don't mean the care home workers looking after my mum. I don't mean my accountant. I don't mean the parents of my children's friends at primary school. I don't mean you. I don't mean you. So populism takes a hold upon the body politic and politicians try to feed the populism with politics. And politics means policy. And a policy designed to address populism, it does mean you. It does mean all of the people that all of the people calling for tougher immigration rules claim it doesn't. It means you. That's why today is such a, such a horrible day. Robin's in Perth. Robin, what would you like to say? Morning, James. Nice oh, to speak to you. Likewise. 
sorry it has to be under these circumstances. Yes, um, so am I. I've just I've been overseas for many many years. Um, came back into the country eighteen months ago. Um, my wife arrived in July, about a month after I was here. We had to fight tooth and nail to get her application approved. It took almost probably the end of a year right. to get it done. Um, my wife's Malaysian, by the way. Okay. Um, we've got a daughter who's just got herself into school, and now we find that she may or may not be able to stay. What's your household income, if you don't mind me asking? At this moment, I'm making about 32, roughly, give or take a, a few hundred here and there. And, and but, uh, is that, that's keeping the family's head above water, is it, if you don't mind me asking? We survive. Yeah. We, we don't, uh, we're not eating out every night and going on fancy holidays or going to the pub. No, but you're not we going survive. down the food bank either. I hope. No, no, no. We're, we're okay. Yeah, we're, we're that's what right. I mean. And and of course, what you've reminded of us of further is the is the extra injustice of geography, because of course the cost of living in some parts of the United Kingdom is considerably lower, and therefore higher than it is in other parts of the United Kingdom. And yet, the thirty eight seven threshold is is going to be sort of brutally applied to everywhere on these islands. What I mean. <sighs> What hoops do you have to jump through at the moment? Were you aware that you needed to be earning, I think, in excess of £18,000 in order for your wife to yeah, come we, here in the first place? You've jumped through all those hoops. We've done all that. We had a lawyer. Um, we employed a lawyer to, to help us out and got that done. So that was £18,600 for your wife to join you here. You had to show that you were earning more than £18,600. Yeah, I, I came here from China, so I... I before we moved, we, we looked into everything and got it all uh, got it all sorted out. So when I secured a job here, the salary was suitable and yeah. over the eighteen thousand limit without any problem. Yeah. So we came back. As I say, my daughter's British. We got her into into school. She settled here. Um, not long after she arrived, she had a slight medical issue, which right. meant that my wife couldn't go back to Malaysia. So we're now on the ten year route. Um, are we going to get to 10 years? Are we going to get to five years? So ten, a 10-year ten route in order for her to get indefinite leave to remain? Yeah. yeah so that's, that's been... Right, yeah. so because she had to leave the country to, 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 to deal with a she, family medical issue back in Malaysia? No, here. My daughter was ill. Oh, OK. Had, so instead of going home after six months, my wife stayed on. Oh, I see um, what you To mean. take care of because I was yeah. working full-time. I can't okay. take care of her. Uh. So... Obviously, with that and one thing or another, with and do you pay for your wife's health? Does she pay the health surcharge? She's done that. How much is paid. that? Uh, that was about eighteen. Was it eighteen hundred? And how much have you paid lawyers? One? How much have you paid lawyers? Uh, thick end of fifteen thousand. Shh! Nearly swore. And now we find out we get hit with this. My wife's sitting here this morning, just about in tears. I bet she is, and I wish I could say something. I mean, all, all I think is that when the full detail of this emerges, they will have to step back from implementing it. But I said that yesterday, and the producer pursed her lips at me, and she was right, and I was wrong. My, my what do you got, think? Uh, what do you think? You're, you know, we're British. This isn't really what we think our country stands for and what it does. Do you, do you think that the current iteration of the Conservative Party, if it is in a position to do so, would push ahead with this sort of policy, a family-splitting policy? The way they're going, it wouldn't surprise me because I don't think they care. So who who is supposed to I'm, be pleased I, about this? Do you, I mean, who is supposed to be cheering this? All the ones who jump up and down saying no more immigrants. Well, I don't know that even they do actually want this. This isn't what we meant. I didn't mean you. Robin, thank you, and I'm sorry, and my love to your wife. <sighs> well, the man responsible for introducing this mode of politics to the United Kingdom, for making the truth worthless, and for uh, seeing the acceleration of incompetence into the highest offices in the land, is, is currently being held to a form of account at the COVID inquiry. Charlotte Lynch has been watching events there with Boris Johnson, and she will bring us up to date shortly but first we have the headlines with thomas watts james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc 10 34 is the time I, I can tell you exactly what mode boris johnson is in he's in oh i'm sorry matron mode i'm sorry i ate all the cake matron 
Um, uh, it, 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 his hair is ridiculous. Listen, I'm not particularly well turned out human being, but if I'm appearing before a judge or, or an inquiry or even an employer, then um, I, 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 I would not turn up looking like a, a dirty mop. Seems to be sharing Michael Fabricant's hair at, at the moment, albeit that he's got the slightly scruffier version, and he's doing that fake, um, fake contrition face, you know, the, the serious face. He's been doing that face since he was eight or nine years old, and he was caught, I don't know, scrumping bloody apples or something. He's been doing that face. I know that face. Everyone who went to a school like mine and gets into trouble a lot learns that face. Some of us grow out of it. But not Boris Johnson. He's doing that for, yes, matron. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. No, sir. Well, I, no, absolutely not, sir. And then he comes out and he closes the door of the headmaster's study behind him and he goes to his mates. <laughs> yeah, come on, lads. Hey, that's what he's doing. That's what he does. That's who he is. And I don't know. I, I mean, you know, getting him out of Downing Street was probably the best it's ever going to get when it comes to him facing consequences of his actions. So I'm not hugely optimistic about the COVID inquiry, but I haven't been watching it as closely as Charlotte Lynch has, who has um, just joined me to talk us through the, the opening salvos. And there was that apology that we, we were expecting. It was reported uh, in the papers across the weekend. And Baroness Heather Hallett, uh, who is chairing the inquiry, actually opened with a, a warning. She was actually less than pleased, it seemed, uh, that details had already been briefed uh, to the papers over the course of the weekend. Not just, uh, sorry, Charlotte, I will give you plenty of room. It's okay. to do, but it's not just briefed to the papers. It's inhaled. It's 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 French kissed. It's caressed by the papers and reproduced verbatim as if this is somehow valid contribution to an inquiry that hasn't even sat down to listen to him yet. Journalists, editors at the Times, editors at the Telegraph, editors at the Sun and the Daily Mail taking dictation from Boris Johnson about what his evidence is likely to contain and what his evidence is, is likely to address. Whereas they all know, they all know that the British public's hopes of justice and truth rely upon Johnson dancing to the inquiry's tune, not somehow enlisting right-wing media to get the inquiry to dance to his tune. It, I mean, one article in The Telegraph today that, frankly, the, the man responsible for writing it should, should, should have demanded that his name be taken off it. An absolutely extraordinary client journalism on a level that we've never had the misfortune of witnessing before. This COVID inquiry, writes someone called Philip Johnston, has already made up its mind on who to blame. Boris, first night. He was the bloody Prime Minister. All the bucks stopped with him. But the right-wing newspapers already mounting sort of rear-guard, retrospective defences. I'll be quiet now and let Charlotte Lynch give you an actual oh, report. It's absolutely OK, James. But, I mean, Heather Hallett, you know, warned against uh, doing that because, of course, the whole purpose of this is for families who suffered so much pain and, and lost during COVID uh, to understand why certain decisions were made. And she expressed that it was important for these details to be heard uh, within the space of, of the inquiry uh, and not to be leaked uh, beforehand. There was some disruption uh, too before he gave that apology but before he did um, it appeared that there was some sort of protest uh, just beforehand we'll play you a little bit of, of what we could uh, see and hear sit down of please the please stop covid Don't victims stop. please sit down <coughs> please sit down or i'm afraid you'll have to leave the hearing room i'm sorry if you don't sit down i'm going to ask the ushers to get you to leave right could ushers please could you ask them to leave now, they were uh, kept off the cameras, but four people, we understand, were removed from the hearing room stand after standing up in almost silent protest as uh, Boris Johnson uh, began to, Do we know to what give their, that what apology their grievance was? to victims. We don't know yet. Okay. Nobody's kind of claim responsibility. Uh, but we know that the COVID-19 bereaved families for justice group weren't able to sit in the hearing room. They were staging some protests outside ahead of his arrival, but he arrived about three hours early to, to avoid those. Um, so I don't think Let's not it was gloss bereaved over that. He did, he did what? He arrived three hours early. Um, to I, avoid the families, the bereaved families. I can't family. say that for certain, but it, it meant that, that yes, he well, avoided you can, you, the we, we can all say he arrived three hours early and therefore avoided the families who had yeah. gathered to express their unhappiness about his leadership during a period in which they lost their family members. Yeah, that's oh, correct. On we go. Here is the apology uh, that he was then able to, to give to the inquiry. Could I say, by your leave, uh, that I understand the feelings of, the, of these victims and their families, and I am deeply sorry for the pain and the loss and the 
suffering of those victims and, and their families. And grateful though I am to the hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers uh, and many other public servants and people in all walks of life who helped to protect our country throughout a dreadful pandemic, I do hope that this inquiry will help to get the answers to the very difficult questions that uh, those victims and those families are, are rightly are asking. Now, questioning by Hugo Keith KC, the chief counsel to the inquiry, began uh, with him asking why thousands of Mr Johnson's WhatsApps are missing. Um, he asked about the disclosure of these uh, documents, WhatsApps, emails. Mr Johnson said, I've done my best to give everything uh, of relevance that I can. He asked, "Is this has this always been your position? He insisted it was yes. Now, a uh, WhatsApp exchange between Simon Case, the cabinet secretary, uh, and Martin Reynolds was then uh, shown to the inquiry where Simon Case said the PM is mad if he doesn't think his WhatsApps will become co uh, public uh, via the COVID inquiry, uh, but he was clearly not in the mood for that discussion uh, tonight. This was a few days after uh, he had ordered uh, the, the, uh, the the inquiry, uh, he'd ordered that, that it was going to take place. Um, it, it turned to the fact that around 5,000 WhatsApp messages weren't accessible. Um, he said he didn't know the reason why that was. It was put to him, is it because the, the phone had been erased? There was a factory reset and, and he said he, he didn't even know what a factory reset was. So he's talking about um, his own phone. Yes, yeah. yeah. And he said he, he hadn't heard of a, a factory reset. Hugo Keith had to explain it to him. Um, but he, he insisted that he didn't know. he had know. the nuclear codes he for, insisted, for, for a period yeah. of three three years or so. But he doesn't know how to operate a mobile phone. Yeah, there we go. He doesn't know what a factory reset is. Um, now, Hugo Keith then reeled off a series of, of, of decisions. In, fa in fact, we'll let you hear it and, and asked if Mr Johnson took personal responsibility for each of those. Do you take responsibility for whatever my lady makes of the speed of the government's response in January, February, March of 2020? Of course. And the way in which the various moving parts of the government, the advisory committees, the departments, the agencies and so on responded. Of course. Do you take responsibility for the lockdown decisions, whichever way they went, and their timeliness, whatever my lady makes of, of them? The manner in which patients were discharged from hospitals into the care sector? Of course. The explosion of the virus within the residential care sector? Yeah. The general speed at which the restrictions were eased. Yes. The eat out to help out scheme. And he said yes uh, and nodded to, to all of those. Now, uh, in a section of his witness statement, he, he also says he unquestionably, I, he said he accepts personal responsibility, unquestionably made mistakes. But of course, he's been preparing to to face this inquiry for months. Uh, and when he was questioned on exactly what those were, Hugo Keith said, what exactly are you apologising for? Mm. He didn't seem to to have an answer. He almost just said, I'd actually find it easier if, if you just ask the questions and, and then I can answer them. And it seems like he will accept anything almost that, that is put to him by the inquiry. As I say, they're accepting the, the responsibility for all the decisions that were made. Uh, but there has been early on, he seemed to dispute evidence that has been placed before the inquiry, uh, which shows that the UK in the Western world did have uh, one of the worst death tolls. Almost all other Western European countries had a lower level of excess death. I've seen. Italy was tragically um, in a worse position than the United Kingdom. Well, I, I, don't wish, I don't wish to, to contradict you, Mr. Keith, but the, the evidence, the, the uh, ONS data I saw put us, I think, about 16th or, or 19th in a table of 33. In Western Europe, we were one of the worst off, if not the second worst off. You must have long reflected since that time why that was so. Why do you think that we had the rate of excess deaths in this country that we did ultimately have? As I say, I think that the statistics vary, and I think that the, um, every country struggled with a new pandemic. Um, and I think the, the UK, from the evidence that I have seen, was well down the European table, and obviously even further down the, 
the, the world table. Uh, if I had to answer why I think we face particular headwinds, I would say it was irrespective of, of government action, uh, we have a, uh, a, an elderly population, extremely elderly population. Uh, we do suffer, sadly, from lots of, of uh, COVID-related comorbidities. And uh, we are a very, very densely populated country, the second most densely populated country in, in Europe. And that, that did not help. Well, when he was asked um, if he believed his decision making led to more deaths, he said, I can't give you the answer uh, to that question. Uh, I can see now they're just getting into uh, the first lockdown, the decisions that, that were made uh, around that. So we'll keep an ear across it and, of course, uh, keep updating you uh, as and when. Petulant, I think, is possibly the word there. Denying the, the statistics that have been presented by, by the KC. And I, I mean, glossing over these WhatsApps. Are these... I mean, Sunak's not got his either, has he, if I understand it correctly? So these are more, most likely to be... And Simon Case is too poorly to give evidence, the Cabinet mm. Secretary. Mm-hmm. We wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, so the three people at the centre, really, of the communications have either lost their messages to each other or been exempted for now, as far as we know, from giving any evidence at all on, on account of unspecified illness. Mm. A significant proportion of them, yeah. Okay. Are, are there any dogs eating homework I'm in the picture sure. at the moment? Are you aware of that? <laughs> it's I, 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 not come up in evidence no, yet. No, nothing's yet come up in evidence. How can the Prime Minister not know where 5,000 WhatsApp messages have gone, covering a period of time during which he was making the single most important decisions of his premiership? And how can a man entrusted with the nuclear codes even claim with a straight face not to know what a factory reset is on his, on his mobile phone? Thank you, Charlotte. We will... Uh, no doubt hear a little bit more from you in the in the well a lot more from you in the course of the day um pmq's coming up at 12 o'clock today i feel like the ambassador in that ferrero rocher advert with all this news you are really spoiling us james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc 10 minutes to 11 is the time. Janet writes very powerfully, 38,000 income stipulation for families with a foreign spouse is calculated with net migration statistics in mind. If the foreign spouse leaves the country, so will the whole family, UK citizens included, three, four or five for the price of one. Some of the electorate will love this. Unfortunately, there is still a demographic who dislikes people who marry foreigners, particularly of another race, and who would like to see British people they regard as race traitors punished. But that, I mean, if you're right, Janet, that would include James Cleverley's dad. Um, Although you add particularly if they are women. Being married to an East Asian, I have experienced this hostility myself very openly. I think this plan is calculated and deliberate in its cruelty. I still can't, and I'm sorry. I still cling to the hope that it's some sort of mistake or that when push comes to shove, the number of people who will become eligible for removal dreadful and unbearable though that is, will not actually be removed. I'm going to warn you now, I'm going to be talking about Boris Johnson in the next hour, and I haven't currently got a phone-in question, which raises the very real possibility of me talking uninterrupted until PMQ starts at 11.55, because he is going through the playbook like a hot knife through butter. All of the things I've spent years explaining to you, he is now providing absolutely incontrovertible evidence of his relationship with the truth, his contempt for scrutiny or accountability, his absolutely deep-rooted belief that the rules the rest of us live by should somehow not apply to him, something first pointed out publicly by his teachers at Eton, and, and it's all there. And, and, and the lies about his WhatsApps. He knows he because how many times have I said to you, unless you can cut him open and prove that he's lying, he will say things that are objectively and absurdly untrue. I've got no idea where 5,000 WhatsApp messages went and I don't know what a factory reset is. I didn't hit her. She ran into my fist, would be the equivalent of that from schoolboy excuses. 10.53 is the time. Uh, Sam's in Stratford to take us back to this horrible migration story, which is so horrible, in fact, I can't quite believe it, Sam. What made you pick up the phone? Thank you very much, James. Um, this is my first time calling LBC. Um, I do listen to you a lot because okay. I spend um, a lot of time in the traffic, so I listen to the radio yeah. due to the nature of my work. So basically, um, I, my wife is on a spouse visa, 
Uh, we've got two kids here, um, a girl of three and a boy, um, six months. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, she's not walking. Um, I've asked her to stay at home because it's, if, I mean, arranging childcare is just um, another yes. issue. Um, so basically, um, she would be due for um, renewal, I think, next year, December. Yeah. Um, I'm working full time. I'm earning just a little bit shy of 35 grand. Yeah. Um, 34,000, some hundreds of money. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, but our total household income is not up to... Um, 38,700. Yeah. So um, it's just basically leaving me in like kind of a limbo. I was shocked. I did listen to some of your program yesterday, but right. I didn't think it applied to those that are currently here. No, did I. But um, um, it appears um, so. So I don't know. Um, I'm just a little bit confused this morning, just after listening to you. Um, well, I, I, I mean, don't shoot the messenger. I know you're not minded to do that. And I hope that this turns out to be better news for families like yours than it currently is. But but this is the Politics and Whitehall editor at The Independent putting these questions specifically to Downing Street and being told that um, that, that, they, that they will apply, um, that, that, that mm. there will be, when your visa comes up for renewal, if your household does not earn £38,700, yeah. then they will be entitled to tell your partner to leave the country. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't mean they will. Yeah, I get, I get I understand a little bit. Because when, if that should happen, I hope not. But, um, so do I. The, the, the two kids are British, um, I, which means I can't carry on working full time. And the government, on one hand, they asking everyone to go back into employment. So the so um, your wife might leave, the kids yeah. would stay. You'd give up your work to look after the children, and sign on. That's an option. Who does that I, help? I want, no, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> I just don't get it. You're getting the feeling they haven't thought this through, Sam. I, I, I tell you, what, I'm, I'm I'm a bit confused at the moment. I just need yeah, to process both. it. Yes, of um, course. I, I haven't done, I've, I would admit, I haven't done any research on, on it at all. I haven't read it. I'm only listening to um, LBC. And no, I well, I'm being very lot, careful. And, and, and to be honest, I erred on the side of optimism yesterday when I said I can't quite believe this would apply to people already here when, when either retrospectively or when visas come up for renewal. But, but the, the specific question was asked of Downing Street. We asked it yesterday and got a sort of a mealy mouth knock back, just to sort of, yeah. we haven't really... Th In fact, between you and me, Sam, when we asked the Home Office this question yesterday, we very much got the impression they didn't know the answer. So then the Independent went to Downing Street and they've obviously had to provide the technical answer. So technically, yes, these people yeah. could become eligible for removal. I still don't think they will, yeah. but, you know, I'm a naive soul and very trusting. Well, um, I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm even having to like process. Like, I'm not going to wait for them. Uh, it's either um, when I get home and discuss with my wife to see if she can get back and get some part time just to top just up, to, um, just to get over the thirty eight thousand yeah. seven hundred limit. And and you know that's that's for the sake of a quid. You can stay. Your family can stay here. And uh, if you if you fail to find that quid to to push you from thirty eight thousand six hundred and ninety nine pounds to thirty eight thousand seven hundred pounds, you can stay. It just seems odd, doesn't it? I know that thresholds always have that in in, in built into them, but it does seem odd. Sam, take care. As I say, I, I mean, my instincts tell me, my patriotic instincts tell me that that it won't come to that. But technically, I think as things stand, it could. James, Tom here. I work as a police officer. After four years' service, I'm on £33,900. I'm due to get married in February to my long-term Tunisian partner. In my line of work, I'm not allowed to do a second job. How am I going to tell my partner that we will need to wait a further three years before my pay grade goes up? Listen, in the short term, Tom, I don't think you're going to have to. If you're getting married in February, just crack on and get, get, get it all done. Um and then, then face this problem or jump off this cliff when the visa renewal comes around because the, the new rules are not going to kick in by February. There's some confusion about when they are going to kick in, but I'd bet a few quid on you've been all right for now and then facing problems when visa renewal comes around, by which point your your new partner would, would just need to be doing something to bring in five grand a year. Uh, whether they're intending to work when they come here, I don't know. But I'm just giving you breathing room. The problem is we're already normalising this policy. We're already talking about ways around, as if that's the, that's the new bedrock. That's the new status quo. That's the new state of the... That's the country we are now. That's the country we are now. That's what we've become. Omar is in Croydon. Omar, what would you like to say? 
Hi, James. Hello. Um, I'm a software engineer uh, working in the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. Um, I'm fortunate enough to um, to be above the threshold in terms of salary. I, yes. I got my wife to come over last year. So again, we're, we're both very fortunate. But I do have friends who's uh, who, who have worked, you know, really hard. They've they've studied here. They've spent a significant amount of money uh, on their education, yes. and they're now in limbo. And uh, one of my couple friends who um, uh, recently, very recently, the the wife actually developed a severe health condition, which uh, where she had to leave her job, and she's she's pregnant now as well. So there's absolutely no chance of her working anytime soon. And the husband is, uh, um, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm I'm pretty sure he he doesn't qualify. Uh, so it's below uh, 38. That threshold. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. So I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen to them because the husband's actually a British citizen now, and he's been here for so long. Um, they've built a life here together. You know, they're pregnant and. Uh, uh, it's it's just horrible. And and just a couple of mo- months ago, actually, the government announced these measures where they banned dependents for uh, undergraduate and master students, uh, as well as raising the the uh, price of uh, the yes, fees of for immigration. That would have brought down numbers anyway. Not to say that that was. A, but also, a good these aren't. The, 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 I guess the fundamental flaw in all of this is is that the the, the people that the racist politicians or the race baiting politicians are talking about when they inflame anti-immigration rhetoric uh, are, are so sort of non-existent or such a tiny part of the bigger picture that none of these policies address the kind of people that Billy Buncher numbers on Twitter is being encouraged every day to get so excited about. It's, no one's talking about going after software engineers, poorly pregnant wives. And yet, I guess that when you allow populism to creep into politics... That's what happens. And then, of course, all of the other people who earn more than £38,700, they can marry foreign nationals. Jeremy Hunt can marry a foreign national. Nigel Farage can marry a foreign national. Um, they're, they're nothing to, they can, 25% of the population, is my rough estimate, are currently allowed to marry whoever they want. Sorry, under the new rules, 25% of the population will be allowed to marry whoever they want. It won't matter where they were born. For 75% of the population... The government is now determining who you can and can't marry, who you can and can't live with. As a British citizen, if you fall in love with a foreigner, the British government has decided that if you earn less than £38,700, you can't live together under the same roof in this country. It's one minute after 11. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. So here we are. All right. Five minutes after 11 is the time. Boris Johnson is giving evidence to the COVID inquiry. Remember, it wasn't his lies about COVID that finally got him slung out by his own party. It was his lies about the appointment to a senior position of a man he knew to be a sex pest and his subsequent lies about whether or not he knew the man to be a sex pest because Johnson lies like the rest of us breathe. I... I don't have a phoning question for you at five minutes after 11. And I am aware that the temptation to follow events at the COVID inquiry live is probably considerable. We'll try and sort of straddle two stools, as it were, by covering it and talking about it. And I I may come up with a question. I may not. I may just wait to see whether you want to ring me and talk about it in a sort of therapeutic way. Uh, the, the, The anger I feel now towards this man is visceral. It, it, you know, for a while, I can I can be funny about it. I, I can, uh, you know, I've just been on a book tour with my new book, and and I do a sort of half decent impression of him, and and you can you can make people laugh about Boris Johnson, particularly at the absurdity of his lies, the the segueing effortlessly from there were no parties to well there there there, there were parties, but I I certainly did not know about them to well yeah yeah there were parties and well i i i did i did i did know about them but i definitely did not attend any oh no 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 sorry folks that's an inverted pyramid of piffle and then he gets to well yeah i i mean there were parties and i i was aware of them and i uh 
And I, I, and it I, turns out I did actually attend them, but I had absolutely no idea that they were parties. And that's funny, right? It's it's somehow absurdly funny. It's it's almost surreal humour that somebody could lie so blatantly, so egregiously. But it was the prime minister doing it in the parliament. That that of course is what led to him being found in contempt, which led to him resigning as an MP in disgrace rather than face the punishment that his peers would have handed down to him a suspension long enough to trigger a recall by election in Uxbridge and Ryslip which he would then have lost that's how shameful he is that's how despicable he is that's how depraved he is he, even when he is found out not with his fingers in the till when he's found he's up to his shoulders He's so deep in the till, his head's in there. It's just his feet poking out of the back of the till. That's just his little feet dangling. He's so deep and he's been found there, right there, ankle deep in the till. And he wriggles out again and starts pretending that he's done nothing wrong. And to their eternal shame, people like Nadine Dorries and Jacob Rees-Mogg queued up to defend him even as his ankles were poking out the front of the till because they're incapable of breaking that cultish hold that he has over them for reasons that I think you probably have to have been a cult member to understand. So the lies are of a scale and of a nature that in modern political life I think you can only compare to Donald Trump. I don't think anybody has lied or can lie as casually and as coolly and as completely as Boris Johnson does, except Boris Johnson. We have learned over the last few weeks that his closest colleagues thought he was diabolical. The cabinet secretary that Boris Johnson appointed because he would prove to be or he was believed to be a soft touch has described Boris Johnson as being utterly unfit for the job. The advisor that he brought in as a sort of mastermind having overseen Brexit Dominic Cummings has described Boris Johnson in terms that you would reserve for your worst enemies these are the people working closest by him the only person who's had anything vaguely warm to say about him is Matt Hancock and let me tell you why they've shaken hands on it I'd bet my house on some sort of gentleman's <laughs> let's rephrase that I'd bet my house on some sort of charlatan's agreement behind the scenes that they won't slag each other off because everybody else is telling the truth about them, about Johnson and about Hancock. Hancock's uselessness facilitated and enabled by Johnson's uselessness, by Johnson's moral corruption, effectively. And now the lies begin. 5,000 WhatsApp messages. No idea. No, 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 no idea. Don't know. Don't know. Technical people. Uh, bleep, bleep. Factory reset. Don't know. Bleep, bleep. I, I, I. <sighs> and then the, 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 the classic, the flooding of the zone with so much manure that it's hard to know where to, where to start. Um, 10 minutes after 11 is the time. We may have made mistakes is one of the latest statements to come out. We may have made mistakes. Turns up three hours early so that he doesn't have to walk the, uh, the gamut of people congregating to remember their lost loved ones and to share their feelings with the man that they consider to be partly responsible for their death. Absolutely extraordinary scenes. Truly extraordinary scenes. 11 minutes after 11 is the time. I, I've asked you so many questions about Boris Johnson over the years, and in many ways they, they all circle back to the same one. They all circle back to the same question, which in a way is how does he get away with it? How does he get away with it? And, and I think I'm going to ask you that again. And I'm going to ask it of you in full knowledge that we don't know whether he's going to get away with it again. Hugo Keith is a much tougher inquisitor than Lindsay Flipping Hoyle, the Speaker of the House of Commons. He's a much tougher inquisitor than any of the interviewers that Boris Johnson deigns to have his toes tickled by on a regular basis. He's a much tougher interviewer or uh, 
uh, scrutineer than the newspaper editors who have given him half a million pounds a year to write columns or already published articles about why he's the real victim in this story. Philip Johnston in the Daily Telegraph today writing an article before Boris Johnson has given a single syllable of evidence claiming that Boris Johnson is the real victim of this. I'd love him to go and read that out to the Covid families assembled outside the inquiry. And remember, it was Daily Telegraph columnists and former editors that convened at the Garrick Club with Jacob Rees-Mogg and others to launch the Save Owen Paterson Society after another one of these charlatans was found to have breached parliamentary standards. Their response, of course, was not to advise their ally to accept the punishment that was coming his way, but to attempt to get him off the hook and rip up the rule book under which he'd been found to be guilty. And, of course, he'll never get questioned like this over at the BBC while the political editor remains a fully paid-up member of the Boris Johnson Admiration Society. So how does he get away with it? Andrew points out that factory resets obviously weren't covered in the technology lessons that Boris Johnson received from Jennifer R. Corey. Again, it's a funny joke. It's a good line. But he was the Prime Minister. And everyone knew he was a liar. Is it all about that guy that rang in when Donald Trump was here? That I always remember saying, but you must know he's lying. Donald Trump was giving a speech in London about the size of the crowds outside the building he was in. And we had a camera outside the building he was in. We were looking at no crowds. And that, that simple juxtaposition of rhetorical claim by a politician with observable reality was, it was chilling. It was spine tingling. I can claim that there are huge crowds, huge crowds, the biggest crowds, the greatest crowds outside this. But and, and I said, well, how does it work? How does that happen? And someone rang me and said, I know he's a liar, but it really upsets people like you and Sadiq Khan. And, and at the time I laughed. But maybe that's all there is. Maybe that's all there is. Maybe your life. And sorry, this is going to sound quite rude. But maybe your life is so weird and your personality so twisted that you find the frustration of people who care about the truth the closest you ever get to feeling joy. Is that it? Nadine Dorries watches Boris Johnson lie and claims that he's the most trustworthy person on the planet. What is wrong with her? It's not really a question about what's wrong with him. What's wrong with her? So, on we go. More to come. I'll remind you of some clips. I will uh, introduce you to some more. We may see or hear from Charlotte Lynch again, who's keeping an even closer eye on proceedings than I am. But whatever transpires at this inquiry or whatever emerges during these hours of evidence, I can tell you this. There will be a significant number of people who think that Boris Johnson has done nothing wrong or that he is somehow the victim of another witch hunt. You remember? It was a witch hunt when he was caught banged to rights by a parliamentary committee containing a majority of Conservatives after even Chris Bryant had stepped down uh, to avoid any accusations or allegations, false allegations really, of impartiality, but belt and braces. And they still called it a witch hunt. It would have been a witch hunt unless the committee consisted entirely of 14 Nadine Dorries clones. That's the only circumstances in which those people would have claimed that he could receive a fair trial. Where do you even begin today? Do you begin with the 5,000 WhatsApp messages that a man who was in charge of the nuclear code somehow doesn't understand and can't find? I don't know. So, what, what, what is your theory now? Because I don't think I've got one anymore. I watch him now and I feel something very new, very different to what I thought when he was in power. Because when he was in power, there is an urgency to the situation. There is a desperate need to share with the population the awfulness that they apparently can't see. How many times have I rather arrogantly described myself as the little boy in the crowd, screaming endlessly that the emperor is naked and being absolutely baffled by the failure of everybody around me to recognise the quivering buttocks in front of them but it's not it's not the right analogy because everybody in the crowd knows that the emperor is naked they've just been somehow persuaded to pretend that they can't see the nudity because the clever tailors had said that only clever people can see the clothes 
So it doesn't quite work, the uh, naked emperor analogy. Just, just now that he's not in power anymore, it's almost as if I've allowed the full horror of what he represents to bubble to the surface. It's now that he can't actually break anything. It's a retrospective reflection upon the ab abject awfulness of him. I mean, the unbelievable awfulness of this man. The things that he's done. You can begin with Brexit. The lies that he's told, the damage that he's done. The contempt in which he holds all the things we're raised to believe are important. Rules, obligations, standards, behaviours, fidelity, honesty, kindness, friendship, loyalty. All of these things we teach our children matter. And Boris Johnson teaches us that you can become the most powerful person in the country by treating all of those things with absolute contempt. How? How does he get away with it? And you can speak to me either as an admirer, if there is still such a thing, 0345 6060973, someone from whose eyes the scales have fallen, because I kind of fell for his stick when I wasn't really paying attention, but how anybody who's been paying even the vaguest attention for the last seven years could still be falling for his stick, I don't know. But I guess the more paid up a member you were of the Boris Johnson Appreciation Society, the more interesting your... Um, explanation of how he gets away with it will be now that you have finally seen the light 03456060973 or like me you can be someone who can chronicle in detail his corruption his awfulness you can chronicle it you've got all the receipts even before you bought my new book which has a whole chapter on him and it didn't even touch the sides of his awfulness like me you can chronicle his awfulness you can detail his corruption and you still don't know how he got away with it how did he get away with it? 0345 6060 It's 1119. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Let's have a little recap then. Um, we'll start with Boris Johnson apologising. You, you'll remember Boris Johnson has actually apologised quite a few times. He spends an awful lot of time insisting that he's never going to apologise and then he apologises. <laughs> For, for the pain and, and loss and suffering, but he's not apologising. Well, you have a listen to this. Could I say, by your leave, uh, that I understand the feelings of, the, of these victims and their families, and I am deeply sorry for the pain and the loss and the suffering of those victims and, and their families. And grateful though I am to the hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers, uh, and many other public servants and people in all walks of life who helped to protect our country throughout a dreadful pandemic. I do hope that this inquiry will help to get the answers to the very difficult questions that uh, those victims and those families are, are rightly are asking. And then the question of personal responsibility. Do you take responsibility for whatever my lady makes of the speed of the government's response in January, February, March of 2020. Of course. And the way in which the various moving parts of the government, the advisory committees, the departments, the agencies and so on responded. Of course. Do you take responsibility for the lockdown decisions, whichever way they went, and their timeliness, whatever my lady makes of, of them? The manner in which patients were discharged from hospitals into the care sector. Of course. The explosion of the virus within the residential care sector. Yes. The general speed at which the restrictions were eased. Yes. The eat out to help out scheme. 24 minutes after 11 and then doing a very classic Johnson tactic, which is denying the statistics or, or, or questioning the, the evidence that is in front of all of us. Almost all other Western European countries had a lower level of excess death. Oh, I've seen. Italy was tragically um, in a worse position than the United Kingdom. Well, I, I, don't wish, I don't wish to, to contradict you, Mr. Keith, but the, the evidence, the, the uh, ONS data I saw put us, I think, about 16th or, or 19th in a table of 33. 
in Western Europe, we were one of the worst off, if not the second worst off. You must have long reflected since that time why that was so. Why do you think that we had the rate of excess deaths in this country that we did ultimately have? As I say, I think that the statistics vary and I think that the um, every country struggled with a new pandemic um, and I think the, the UK from the evidence that I have seen was well down the European table and obviously even further down the, the, the world table. Uh, if I had to a- answer why I think we face particular headwinds, I would say it was irrespective of, of government action, uh, we have a, uh, a, an elderly population, extremely elderly population. Uh, we do suffer, sadly, from lots of, of uh, COVID-related comorbidities. And uh, we are a very, very densely populated country, the second most densely populated country in, in Europe. And that, that did not help. Remarkable, really, to go from world beating to claiming that 15th or 19th on a list of 33 is some sort of victory. Uh, And, of course, um, deploying that Donald Trump tactic of essentially looking at graphs that have been put in front of them and denying that they're real or denying that they're accurate. And then the bit that you haven't heard yet involves Simon Case, the Cabinet Secretary, who's currently off sick and therefore unable to give evidence, including about the, 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 the missing WhatsApps. But some WhatsApps are not missing, including the ones that Hugo Keith refers to here is 48313 page 16 on the screen these are communications between Mr Cummings and yourself in May 2020 where we're concerned with the the bottom half of the page so can you expand it because I can't yes 7th of May Hancock is unfit for this job the incompetence, the constant lies, the obsession with media bull****. Reference to testing. You must ask him where we'll get to 500,000 per day and where's your plan for testing. And if you can scroll back out. But, just, sorry, I don't pause, be- just pause a second, Mr. Johnson. If you then scroll in, please, to the bottom half of the page, the last part. Mr. Cummings says, yeah. it'll certainly be a cock up like everything else but it'll be far from the worst of our cock-ups over the next eight weeks. You need to think of Binning Hancock, and so on and so forth. You cannot suggest that you are unaware of the opinion taken by your chief advisor over your Secretary of State for Health. You cannot suggest you are unaware of the concerns expressed by your Cabinet Secretary about the toxic reputation of your operation, because he wants to help you directly. You cannot suggest that there weren't grave concerns being expressed in Downing Street, that there were people who simply would not come and work for you because of the atmosphere you were allowed to develop. So, uh, first of all, in in politics, there's uh, never a time when you're not, if you're Prime Minister, you are constantly being lobbied by somebody to sack somebody else. Uh, It's just what I'm afraid happens, and uh, it's, it's part of life. Everybody's constantly militating against some other individual for some reason of, of, of their right. It's just, it's just the, I'm afraid that's the, the nature of it. Uh, it is perfectly true that this advisor in particular uh, thought, uh, had a low opinion of, of the health secretary. I thought he was wrong. Uh, I stuck by the health secretary. I thought the health secretary uh, worked very hard and whatever he may have had uh, defects but I thought that he uh, was doing his best in very difficult circumstances and I thought he was a good communicator Cummings there not Case my bad um, we'll have a look at what, what Simon Case has had to say so it, it, he's doing it this is what I find so extraordinary he's doing it they're handing him receipts and he's denying they exist here is proof that your senior advisor thought your secretary I told you him in Hancock have got each other's back. I'll take, I'll take that as an early win. Handed proof that the senior advisors and indeed the cabinet secretaries will discover shortly, as we've already heard, 
thought that everything was absolutely awful. And he is doing what he always does. He is sitting there going, no, no, don't recognise that. No, not at all. No, this is normal. No, people are always... It's just not true. Everything he says is untrue. And yet the question of how the hell he gets away with it remains almost impossible to answer. Thomas Watts is here now with your headline. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.34 is the time. Peter says he gets away with it because we let him. And his cronies get away with it because they're basically beyond the law. Tony on the Wirral, hate is a strong word and a strong emotion, James, but I can honestly say the visceral hatred I have for Johnson and all he stands for is palpable. Marcus in Derbyshire suggests he gets away with it because he validates people's prejudices. Uh, he got away with it because he's a crony, a member of that club that is protected by other cronies. And finally, Paul in Yorkshire, I absolutely share your anger and disgust at the man who has brought shame to this country and to the highest political role in our democracy. Thank you for expressing the deep emotions of many who wish for honesty and humanity in our land. It shouldn't be a lot. It's not a lot to ask for, is it? But here we are, and here he is, doing what he always does. 11.35 is the time, securing the knowledge that in tomorrow's newspaper... How is the Daily Mail going to report honestly on Boris Johnson's testimony when they're paying him half a million pounds a year to write a column? How, how is... I, I forget whether it's GBB's or the other one where he's got a TV show. How are they going to report honestly on their colleague giving absolutely a ridiculous, ridiculous testimony? How do you think this WhatsApp story is going to get reported in, for example, the newspaper that's currently paying him half a million pounds a year to write bilge about Barbie? Do you know why your phone was missing those 5,000 odd WhatsApps? I don't know the exact reason, but it looks as though it's something to do with the app going down and then uh, coming up again. Um, but somehow uh, not automatically erasing all the things uh, between that date when when it went down and the moment when it was last backed up so I I can't give you the technical explanation but that's the best I'm able to give I'm going to play that again shortly because it it is impossible to exaggerate the arrogance and contempt you would need to have in place to even think about saying that in public he might as well have said this. He might as well have literally said to Hugo Key. I used to do daytime television, and I won't tell you who it was that told me. It doesn't matter what you say. It's all about the rhythm with which you say it, particularly if the audience was elderly. So you could be sitting there saying something they completely disagreed with, but if you got your cadences correct, they'd all start cheering at the end. So you sort of go, I'll tell you something else about Thomas the Tank Engine. It might be written for children, but if you pay attention, then adults will love it too. And they'll start clapping. I think you need to hear someone else's voice. Henry's in Stanton. Is it Stanton St. John, Henry, or Stanton St. John? St. John. Um, hi, morning, James. Hello. Um, I, just, I just wanted to say, firstly, um, how ashamed I am this morning to be British, to hear this news and, and these poor frightened people who, you know, um, maybe, I'm, I'm sure they won't be, but maybe... Um, you mean the um, immigration stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just wanted too. to say that. No, good uh, on I, you. I, it's it's absolutely shameful, and I'm a conservative, but this is not conservative behaviour. Yeah, damn right. Um, and I, just going back to Boris, yes, I Johnson. I remember when he came along, and I, w- I, I I'm afraid I voted for him. I fell into that trap, and I remember hearing Max Hastings, the ex editor of the Evening Standard, saying and the Telegraph, and the Telegraph, yeah. saying he was lazy. He had lots of you know, just saying yes, he was yes. an awful man. who do not vote for him. And but I voted for him. I didn't want to vote for McConnell and um and the other guy. No, sure. Uh, um, and and then I th- then the pandemic came along, and I remember just before the pandemic thinking, my God, we're, we're, there's going to be this amazing time where everything's going to be really great. And the pandemic came along, and I think we very quickly saw that Boris Johnson wasn't able to deal with governing. And I think it's a shame in a way that the pandemic did come along because I think he would have been out on his ear much quicker had he had to mm. do the normal day to day governing of a. Prime oh Minister. really? Oh, that's fascinating. Because yeah. I, I, wow. I'm not so sure about that. God, it's nice no. to have a it's nice to have a bit of a political I, I, conversation I, I, rather than just be sitting here marvelling at how bloody awful <laughs> everything is. But I think I, I, I think that Cummings probably would have 
started enacting his grand plan if COVID hadn't come along. And, and Johnson would have carried on writing his Shakespeare biography while Dominic Cummings got on with the business of running the country. <laughs> Um, I think the problem is he's a deeply lazy man. He lies at every opportunity. And um, But the, the, the awful thing is, and this pains me, mm. he has got what he wants. He is now, mm. he, uh, compared to his peers, the Johnsons did not have the kind of money like the people that they um, play oh, around absolutely. With. No, you're absolutely and, right. And now he's earning an absolute fortune. He's having the most wonderful time. He's just bought a huge house around the corner from here. Mm. Um, he's got exactly what, he's, he's, what he wanted, and he's laughing at us. And I think that's despicable. And um, I want you to I'm, be wrong, and I'm conscious that I might now be contradicting you because I want you to be wrong so much. But I, but I, I, don't, I don't know that material success can actually sate the narcissistic needs of a man like Johnson. He needs to be yeah. revered. He needs to be admired. He needs to be honoured. And well, he isn't let, now. He well, is. I hope, think he's a broken yeah, shell. Yeah, he's, he's a broken shell. And, and um, he, he'll never be honoured again. Um, but I just think it's a great shame that we've had to go through this. And can I just finally say... Of course. Could we please look at paying our politicians properly? If we start an interesting paying point. them... No, no, I don't think today's the day for this. Henry. Okay. Oh, boy. I appreciate that you're probably okay, looking at... Some, you're looking at your own future career ambitions we here. Now, it's not, no, we politics. may get... We may, hey, I'm not shouting you down. I, I, no, I probably no, no, no. agree with you. I'm just not sure that today no, no, is, no, no, that today is the day. And it's not, I do want to ask you one more thing. What, what Was yeah. there a moment? Was it a gradual, incremental process that saw the scales fall from your eyes or did they drop off in a single moment may i ask um i mean i'm not a, i wasn't a fan of brexit i didn't vote to sure. leave the eu i'd love to be back in the eu um so that wasn't a great time but i i just think when when he ignored the scientists and He's just making and, it up just <laughs> making it up as he went along Go on, chaps. Well, tally ho cross your fingers we'll be Absolutely. fine let it run through the yeah i mean it was so obvious and so evident that one wonders why the entirety of the conservative parliamentary party failed to notice um i've got the clip now of uh hugo keith asking johnson about a, 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 i just want to tell you who Simon Case and Mark said, "Well, were arguably they are the most senior or the or the most important non-elected members of the Downing Street operation." So, well, actually, you'd have to add um, what's his chops Cummings to that list. So, uh, th th these are the people who were, uh, I mean, succeeded each other essentially as cabinet secretary and head of the Home Civil Service. And they were exchanging messages with each other that Hugo Keith has just read to Boris Johnson. Mr. Case refers at the top of the page to how you have told Mr. Cummings outright to stop talking to the media in his presence. This place is just insane, zero discipline. And then in the bottom half of the page, these people are so mad madly self-defeating it's hard to ask people to march it should be to the sound of gunfire and then the cabinet secretary the cabinet secretary is the head of the civil service is he or she not i've never seen a bunch of people less well equipped to run a country that's not a matter of atmospherics or lobbying or part of the general day in day out friction within government is it uh, yes I, th I think it is and um, I think that if, as I say, if you'd had the views of the Mandarinate about the Thatcher government in unexpurgated WhatsApps, milady, uh, I think you would have found that they were pretty fruity. Um, it's, it's WhatsApp conversation is... Um, intended to be, uh, though clearly it isn't, uh, ephemeral, um, it, it tends to, uh, pejor the, to the pejorative and the hyperbolical. And I think that um, the, the, the worst vice, in my view, would have been to have had a, uh, an operation where everybody was so deferential and, and so um, 
reluctant to, to make waves, that they never expressed their opinion, uh, they never challenged, and they never doubted. It's, it was much more important to have a group of people who are willing to doubt themselves uh, and to doubt each other. And I, and I think that that was creatively useful rather than the reverse. I have never seen a bunch of people less well equipped to run a country. Uh, at this rate, Simon Case writes to his predecessor as cabinet secretary, I will struggle to last six months. These people are so mad. Not poisonous towards me yet, but they are just madly self-defeating. And another bit that possibly didn't get fully conveyed in that clip is that they couldn't find good people to come in and help because the toxic atmosphere created by Dominic Cummings was putting everybody off. And Johnson, who's suddenly become an expert on WhatsApp in the space of 20 minutes, he's gone from not really knowing how it works and something about it rised up and servers came down and I lost 5,000 messages and oh, whoops a daisy, to being a world authority on what people use WhatsApp for and why it's not to be trusted. Why an exchange of confidences between a cabinet secretary and his immediate predecessor describing Boris Johnson and his colleagues as being mad and the worst, the least well-equipped bunch of people to run a country. Boris Johnson trying to dismiss it as what the kids call banter. It's almost as if we've learned absolutely bloody nothing. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Also been shown Patrick Valance's diary, which, remember, he was never expecting to see the light of day, the former chief scientific advisor, the last line of which reads, this all feels like a complete lack of leadership. And Hugo Keith puts it, in all the coverage it says Keith. I keep thinking it's our Keith. And Keith's usually wanging on in my ear about adverts and stuff. But it, it, the BBC coverage of this keeps saying, Keith puts it to Johnson that it is extra. I think, what's Keith doing over there? What are you doing there, man? You've got a job to do here. It's extraordinary for the government's chief scientific advisor, alongside cabinet secretaries and other advisors, to be commenting negatively in this way about the PM. And he does this thing again. This is wholly to be expected, replies Johnson, as if it is normal. For every single person in his inner circle, God, I'm, I am occasionally so close to swearing on the program, and we never have, have we? There's occasional, you know, we've 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 never broken any rules, we've never sworn in a in a rule breaking fashion. But there are words, there are words that I would like to use to describe Boris Johnson that would see me dragged off air in a heartbeat. There really are. This is wholly to be expected. Every single person in his inner circle, except Matt Hancock, thought that Boris Johnson was a complete... Better get the beep ready, Keith. You better get the beep ready. Boris Johnson was an absolute... Boris Johnson was a complete and utter... Everyone. Chief Scientific Advisor. Cabinet Secretary, Head of the Civil Service, Chief Advisor, everybody, Chief Medical Officer, everybody thought that Boris Johnson was absolutely awful. It's wholly to be expected, says Johnson. Changing collective understanding, something science, blip. WhatsApps. I don't even know what the worst bit is. Listen to him talking about WhatsApp messages. And remember, if you still feel warm towards Boris Johnson, this is just how much contempt he has for you. Do you know why your phone was missing those 5,000 odd WhatsApps? I don't know the exact reason, but it looks as though it's something to do with the app going down and then... Uh, coming up again um, but somehow uh, not it, it, it automatically erasing all the things uh, between that date when, when it went down and the moment when it was last backed up so I, I can't give you the technical explanation but that's the best I'm able to give 11.51 is the time. PMQ's on the way. Anthony's in Hitchin. Probably either burst a blood vessel or fallen asleep, Anthony. You've been on hold for so long. What would you like to say? It's more likely the, the, the former than the latter, James. Mm. I mean, I think 
for me, the key point is forget about the, the usual suspects, the Telegraph, et al. We know the bills they're going to pump out. What really got me today was I looked at my phone and I had an alert. I'm pretty certain it was Sky News or BBC, yeah. but it was one of the what you would class the more reliable. Boris Johnson plans to apologise. And I'm just thinking, mm. wow, do you, do you, real, do you not realise you, you're probably subconsciously sort of rehabilitating that, mm. that image of him? And it's, it's it, not subconscious, it mate. It's not, it's not subconscious. Yeah, it's it, client it, journalism. And it, it, I, it, I don't think it would have been necessarily either of the outlets that you just alluded to. And if it was, they're, they're reporting stuff that's been fed to the newspapers. And broadcasters should know better than to regurgitate stuff that's been dictated to newspapers. But sometimes the, you know, the urgency of a newsroom atmosphere means that they fall into that trap as well. Yeah, that, I think that was that was the main thing. Really. I looked at it and I thought, really? You know, if, if it was something that sort of come up from the usual suspects, then mm. of course, yeah, they're going to... Oh, yeah, I take your point. They're going to back for him. But it just, it just, to me, and like you said earlier on, I mean, there is, there's, for me, it's that sums up the problem because... The extremes on either side are going to stick with that. But, they, you know, the average person in the street who perhaps isn't as engaged as what you are or either side or in the middle of the tribe, they mm. look at that and they think, oh, it, it's that it feeds that subconscious psyche. And they think, oh, is he actually that bad? Or we've seen that. And that might be the only thing that I, I mean, you know, obviously it's a bit of a simplistic look at it. But I just I just looked at it and the first thought that came into my head is, have you not seen the damage that man has caused to this country? And yet you, you, you're either consciously or subconsciously feeding that beast and sort of taking us back into the time when, to be fair, you know, I've got the old DVDs from a bygone news to you. It was funny when he was a backbencher, but oh, it was an I, absolute I, car crash yeah, when well, he was in I, charge. I thought you'd just, I thought you'd just uh, overstep the swear word mark then, but car crash is a fully acceptable turn of phrase to use at this point. And, and, and I guess it happens, the higher up the ladder he climbs, the more inappropriate he, he becomes for, for, for the positions that he's in. And the harder it is for people who've helped him get there to turn around and um, acknowledge that he never should have got there in the first place. It's, it's, it's increasingly fascinating. I mean, because the media you refer to, at the time, there was a sort of Boris Johnson fan club in the country. The 2019 election result would be the peak of it. A lot of it was um, a, a sort of repulsion towards being repelled by Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was linked to the idea, I think even those of us who knew that Brexit was going to be an unmitigated disaster were, were, were quite keen for it to happen by then so we could get on with the business of proving ourselves right and beginning the very slow process of undoing all the damage that it would do. So get Brexit done was even an effective policy. And then probably the third factor on that was a personal popularity of Boris Johnson, a sort of club ability. But and, and and that was the peak of it. That was the peak of it um, just then. And <laughs> the, the the speed of that decline among the public seems to me to be spectacular. And yet the Conservative Party membership and the newspaper editors are pretty much the only people left in the fan club. That's the bit I don't quite get. Why can't they see what we see? There's no co no comment, but I mean, it, yeah. it, if ever there was an example of, you know, never again should the choice be at the ballot box between two people who permanently look like they spent the night in the skip, that's it really, isn't I it? So, I'm not going to go on pot kettle on personal appearance, Anthony. You, as a very dapper gentleman, you're perfectly entitled to, but um, it, it was more the content of the electoral offer than necessarily the sartorial presentations that troubled me. Thank you, mate. Take care. And James in Nottingham. James, last word on the eternal question of how. Yeah, good morning, James. I, I think perhaps you're being a tiny bit disingenuous if you haven't come up with an idea yourself that could cover how he gets away with it. It's usually, in my experience, it's fear or corruption or a little bit of both. Or you know, somebody. I think the question. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I don't think I'm being disingenuous because the question for me it constantly evolves and and you answer mm. it up to a point, but then you get to the next point and he's still getting away with it. The reason why it's an interesting question today is because we don't know if he is going to get away with it again. Although, given the slavish support he'll receive from the newspapers, he probably will. But it is well, I, the question I becomes interesting again and again and again with every new iteration of his awfulness. I believe. Yeah, I agree with you that he might not get away with it. So he's been getting away with it, and we don't know how he's been doing that. Yeah. But somebody must be assisting him somewhere. Or if the world is just a lot more weird than I ever thought it was, and it doesn't make sense, and yeah. we don't know how, and it's just some sort of magical act that he is getting away with it. I think the thing that he believes is, like a lot of the school children I used to teach when I was a, a teacher in classrooms, yes. um, it's, 
you, it's not cheating unless you get caught. Yeah, yeah. You definitely got that. Yeah. Up. And then once you need evidence, I mean, it's like if you're being gaslighted by somebody, you need to find, get the evidence, show it to them, and then show it to a third party who can agree with you and say, yes, it's not you, it's them. Yeah, um, and, and but even if you do that, he'll say that's not evidence. He's done it today. Yeah, that's that's the baffling one. When he's and then I'm going to choose to believe face. him. So here is, you know, I, I always think of him as being like Billy Bunter with pie juice smeared all over his face, and he is insisting mm. he has not eaten a pie. And you, you cannot cut him open and show mm. people the pie. That's when, at one point, I think it was Dorries who even said, well, you don't know what was going on inside Boris Johnson's head. When he was lying to the House of Commons, you can't prove that he knew he was lying. And that, that, that level of cultish devotion is, I think, quite possible. I wonder if we should speak to a... It's a bit late now, actually. We should have had this idea about a year and a half ago. Speak to an actual cult deprogrammer about Boris Johnson and, and why someone like Nadine Dorries remains so committed to the belief that the world's going to end at 10 past two on Tuesday. What do you do on Wednesday morning? I guess it never comes, does it? I oh, know the world will end. Actually, I made a mistake. It's going to be next Tuesday or the one after that or the one after that. Boris Johnson, a man more sinned against than sinning. Not f I mean, can't remember the last time that politics watchers have to drag their eyes away from something that's arguably more interesting than PMQs to start contemplating an imminent PMQs. But Natasha Clark is here to help us do precisely that. We're trying. Yes. Um, do you want to talk about Johnson, or, or do, do we wade straight in on PMQs? We can go straight in on PMQs. What, what, do we, what do you think is going to happen? Bearing in mind that Keir Starmer, by your analysis, and it was shared by many, had his finest ever outing last week. I'll last stick by Wednesday. that. Yeah, I, think I think a lot of people right. agreed with us uh, last week that he had a really good session. So really, he can only fall from grace from here, can't he? Can it, any way is down. So it could be, it could be even better. It could than the last one. You can have two bests in a row, as we prove every day on this radio program. <laughs> sure. So what do we think is going to come up? Um, I am obviously wondering what's going to come up. But I've been, as you know, have had my head in the COVID inquiry mm. today. I wonder if Keir Starmer is going to mention. Keir Starmer will mention anything. Uh, from the inquiry, we've also had um, a London shooting overnight and a very sad news about stabbing in Aberfan. Mm. Um, I wonder if uh, Keir Starmer might bring those up. Um, uh, Rishi Sunak will obviously want to hail his migration partnership, which now, James talk cleverly to me a bit signed about yesterday. This. Where, where, where is there any clear blue water between the Tories and Labour on migration? Because Starmer has been mildly critical of the Rwanda scheme, but he has been to the dismay of many traditional Labour supporters. He's been pretty much in lockstep with the Tories on, on the problematic nature of immigration per se and, and, and in general or, or, or the current figures. It's only really the Scottish National Party that are prepared to stand up and remind everybody that without immigration um, at the levels it's been at for many of the recent years, the country would be in all sorts of trouble. True, and I think Keir Starmer will say that he will cancel that Rwanda policy. That's his clear blue water between the Labour Party and the Conservatives. That's what he will argue. Um, but yes, uh, I think what we will probably get into is a little bit of the detail of this these migration announcements mm. that we've seen in the last couple of days. And will Sir Keir Starmer come out and defend those salary thresholds? Because we know that that is becoming quite a contentious topic. People saying that we should not be pricing people out of love. Um, allow not allowing people to come to the UK to, uh, to to come and live here if they don't earn a certain amount of money. If the person that they want to be with cannot earn that, that is se essentially separating families. And I think there'll be a lot of pressure on on the Labour benches for, for Sakir Starmer to, to vote down some of these migration uh, measures uh, if, if they do come to a vote um, and, and essentially to, to stand up for that. So I wonder whether Keir Starmer might mention that today at PMQs. I, I mean, I suppose most people would accept that the need for some figure, some sort of threshold, and uh, 18,000, you could possibly argue, was too low, even as you argue that 38,700 is too high, or at least that the leap from one to the other involving a 20 grand hike overnight is, is unfair. And, and too quick. I, yesterday, Natasha, I don't know why, from a place of naivety or idealism, I just thought they can't possibly be intending these policies to apply to people who are already here. No, they won't. But The Independent reported that they do, that, that when you reapply for a visa, this threshold will actually kick in and, and that you may have your visa re-application, re your visa renewal application rejected in the event of the household income being lower than £38,700. You, you 
know this lot much better than I do. I can't see them actually ordering removals of parents of British children, even though technically they've given themselves the right to do that. Yeah, I don't know the specifics about where it, whether it will apply when you reapply for your visa said it will. or not. Um, I think in terms of whether you've got a permanent residency in the UK, what kind of visa you're on, I'm sure all of those things um, will probably have an impact. But yes, obviously, when you're making a new application for a new visa, that is pot potentially will come into effect. But these rules haven't come in yet. They're not coming in until the spring. The spring of 2024. Yep, so, so the lad the moment, getting married in February needs to crack on and get all his paperwork in place you, and i'm not i'm saying that genuinely and with a sense of urgency get you know get a crack on with the marriage get all your paperwork in place get it sorted by the end of february and you'll be golden until renewal time comes around i actually wonder and i know politicians i've heard have made this case yet whether we will see a rush of people trying to beat that deadline when it does come we don't have a date for it coming in yet but if they do you know will that be will we see a rush of people trying to to make it here and try and circumvent those rules i'm sure we will we'll jump over to the house of commons as soon as keir starmer gets to his his feet um, and uh, the, the I mean we're, we're pretty much up in the air on what is likely to come up today last week um, uh, the week before last took us completely by surprise so we'll, we'll, we'll watch with interest um, and the COVID-19 inquiry continues continues to unfold the, on the immigration stuff which for good or for ill is dominating political discourse once again if, if these policies are quote successful end quotes and the numbers come down in the hundreds of thousands the statistics won't be published until after the next general election, will they? Yeah. So, I don't usually agree with Suella Braverman, but she did make this point yesterday um, that actually... Well, it's not an opinion. No, I mean, it's Let's fact. not get it's carried not... away. Suella Braverman hasn't suddenly sure. discovered a power of insight. It's just no, counting. For sure. But she, she did raise it. I, she yeah. was the first person that, that came uh, and had mentioned the fact that we will not see the impact of any of these migration figures until after the next election. So her argument being, well, I wanted to do this a year ago and I was told I can't. So, yes, we, we will not be seeing it. I think it goes back to the question of trust, right? Do you trust the Conservatives are going to bring down the numbers? Because they haven't done so so far. They've just gone up and up and up. And I think going into an election saying, trust us, we're going to do things differently right now after 13 years is, is a pretty big ask for many people. 14 by the time they go into the election, yeah. And I just a lot of people wondering what actually happened at the... COVID inquiry when uh, 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 Lady Hallett asked people to leave, it was it was COVID families um, holding up blank, uh, holding up plain pieces of paper, simply saying that that the dead can't hear your apology, um, and and having refused to sit down, they were led out. So just 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 filling in some of the gaps in the uh, in the coverage of the COVID inquiry today, we got an astonishing scene just briefly on the television when the, 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 I'm watching. I've got Sky News on in the background. And they've got they've got a split screen. They've got Boris Johnson giving evidence of the COVID inquiry, and they just had Michael Fabricant on his feet in the House of Commons, on the same screen. That that was quite a surreal little moment. It turns out they're not sharing the same wig. They they are actually both in possession of um, independent hair. Have today. you ever seen them in the same room? Together? No, no well, I, well, I've seen them on the same screen now. That's mm. the closest it will come, I think, to ever ever seeing them in the same room. We're we're now at the part of our uh, Wednesday afternoon contemplations where we are waiting for Keir Starmer to get to his feet and pretending that we've got interesting things to say in the meantime. Go on then. I have many interesting Pre things Pretend to say. that you've got something interesting to say. How, how many people do you think will be watching PMQs today compared to usual as opposed to continuing to watch Boris Johnson? Well, I'm interested to see whether Sky News stick with this or they swap over to PMQs. What's your better going to do? They're trying to do both, aren't they, at the moment? You can't, do, doing, you can't gonna, do both in terms of the they'll audio, cross, they? They'll cross over. Think? They'll, yeah, okay. they'll cross over when it starts because for good or for ill, the COVID inquiry is rear view mirror stuff, whereas the uh, PMQs is, 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 is very much off the moment. Quite a lot Although of people watching that stream of the COVID inquiry today, about 15,000 people when I was last on it. It, it. And and they're taking rather longer than usual to get going at PMQs. I don't know why that is, just presumably parliamentary business. Maybe a little bit of a log jam. Everyone was stuck in the lobby what stuck in the canteen watching the telly yeah or stuck on a train train strikes day today so it's been a, a hell of a morning for me to get in um you can of course follow the covid inquiry live on our sister station lbc news so you won't be taking pmqs in its entirety there we, we will take the relevant bits here that generally involves keir starmer's questions rishi sunak's answers and then the contributions from stephen flynn the westminster leader of the smp and sunak's responses to that, but there is a sort of curious dichotomy in political coverage at the moment, with 50% of attention still being focused on events at the COVID inquiry and 50% of attention sort of 
focused on the House of Commons waiting for PMQs to get underway. If your life depended on it, what will the first question be about? For, for Keir Starmer? Yeah. It doesn't. Don't worry. Your life doesn't depend I, on it. But if it did... I think I get, would, if I were him, I would go with... We've seen more stabbings. We've seen more shootings. This shocking. Isn't this a, a symptom of Tory Britain? Seven minutes after 12. We, we, we shall see. Um... This is remarkable, actually. I don't know. Have, have, we, missed have we missed it? Have we got the wrong? Have we got the wrong screen up? Well, no, Rishi's just. Rishi's just going on speak. the rebellion because the backbenches, the Tory backbenches. He did that last week, didn't he? he? Did all six questions on migration. Are you going to do that again? Well, he could do. But there, there's there's actual do. clear disagreement, isn't lots, there, over the news. European Convention on Human yeah, Rights? With, with about a hundred Tories absolutely adamant we shouldn't ditch it, and about a hundred Tories absolutely adamant that we should. Yeah, tearing themselves apart over migration. Um, what's new in the Conservative Party? Uh, but yes, there is this row going. On about exactly how far this emergency legislation on Rwanda will go. We are expecting, we are expecting it tomorrow, but we're hearing it might come as early as this afternoon now. The, the legislation. Mm -hmm. So they've clearly made some sort of decision. The Prime Minister has clearly taken a stance and it sounds like he has gone for what MPs are calling the semi-skimmed version, mm. which is not quite as hardline as some Conservative MPs on the right of the party would like to see. Uh, it probably will mean a carve out in terms of the law on the Human Rights Act, but it will not include a carve out on the law on the European, European Convention of Human Rights, which some MPs were really pushing for. That seems to be the dividing line between most Conservative MPs at the moment. Which means the Supreme Court could well send it back again. I, I completely agree. And yeah. I, I just think there's no way of being around, getting around it unless you do this extreme option. Which and here, is, Sir, do, here is Sir Keir Starmer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's very good to see you in your place. And we wish the Speaker a speedy recovery. Uh, this week we lost two giants of the Labour family and I thank the Prime Minister for his comments. Alistair Darling was a man of unassuming intelligence, warmth and kindness. He brought a calm expertise and, in private, a cutting wit and devoted his love of his family was ever present. Our thoughts are with Maggie, his wife, Callum, Anna, who he loved so dearly. Glenys Kinnock was a passionate campaigner for social justice who changed lives home and abroad. She was a loving and supportive partner and mother, and her death is a huge loss to all of us. We are thinking of Neil, of Stephen, Rachel, and of all the family. Yeah, yeah. Can I also echo the Prime Minister's comments in relation to Lord Douglas Hamilton? And in relation to the Hillsborough families, they deserve justice. Yeah, yeah. In a previous capacity, I worked with the families. They waited a very, very long time for the findings, thanks to people in this House, um, and they've waited a long time for this response, but I'm glad it is now coming. Madam Deputy Speaker, if the purpose of the Rwanda gimmick was to solve a political headache of the Tories' own making, to get people out of the country who they simply couldn't deal with, then it's been a resounding success. <laughs> After all, they've managed to send three Home Secretaries there, <laughs> an achievement for which the whole country can be grateful. So, apart from members of his own cabinet, how many people has the Prime Minister sent to Rwanda? <laughs> well, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I've been clear before, we will do everything it takes. Mr. Speaker, we will do everything it takes to get this scheme working so that we can indeed stop the boats. And that's why this week we have signed a new legally binding treaty with Rwanda, which together with new legislation will address all the concerns that have been raised, because everyone should be in no doubt about our absolute commitment to stop the boats and get flights off. Because, Madam Deputy Speaker, and this is the crucial point that the Honourable Gentleman doesn't understand, deterrence is critical. Even the National Crime Agency Agency have said that you need an effective removals and deterrence agreement if you truly want to break the cycle of tragedy that we see. But what we heard this morning from his own ministers was that, was that they would scrap the scheme even when it is operational and working. As again, once again, Mr Speaker, once again, instead of being on the side of the British people, he finds himself on the side of the people smugglers. Madam Deputy Speaker, when they first announced this gimmick, they claimed Rwanda would settle tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands of people. Then the Deputy Former Prime Minister 
quickly whittled it down to mere hundreds. Yeah. Then the Court of Appeal in June made clear there's housing for just 100. The current number of people sent there remains stubbornly consistent, zero. Yeah. Yeah. At, the same, at the same time, at the same time Madam Deputy, Article 19 of the treaty says the parties shall make arrangements for the United Kingdom to resettle a portion of Rwanda's most vulnerable oh. refugees in the United Kingdom. So how many refugees from Rwanda will be coming here to the UK under the treaty? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, what? Oh, Madam Deputy Speaker, sorry. Mad- Order! Prime Minister. It addresses all the concerns of the Supreme Court. But I, it's, it's a point of pride, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we are a compassionate country that does welcome people from around the world. But, but let's just, let me just get the Honourable Gentleman up to speed on what we are doing. Reduce the number of illegal arrivals from Albania by 90%. Increase the number of illegal working raids by 50%. Because of all the action, we've taken the number of small boat arrivals down by a third, Madam Deputy Speaker. But what is the Honourable Gentleman's plan? Because it comes down to he just simply doesn't have a plan to address this problem. On a, but no, no, I'm probably being unfair because he does have a plan. It's to cook up a deal with the EU that would see us accept 100,000 illegal migrants. Migration has trebled on his watch, and all he can do is make up numbers about the Labour Party. It's really pitiful. I'm not actually sure the Prime Minister can have read this thing. Article 4 says the scheme is capped at Rwanda's capacity. That's 100. Article 5 says Rwanda can turn them away if they want. Article 19 says we actually have to take refugees from Rwanda. How much did this fantastic deal cost us? Prime Minister. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, as the Home Secretary was crystal clear about, there is no incremental money. There is no incremental money that has been provided. This is about ensuring that the concerns of the Supreme Court have all been addressed in a legally binding treaty that will allow us to operationalise the scheme. But I'm glad he raised the topic of legal migration, which I agree is absolutely far too high, Madam Deputy Speaker. That's why this week we've outlined a plan bigger than any other government before to reduce the levels of legal migration by three pounds. It's an incredibly comprehensive plan. So if he cares so much about it, the simple question for him is, does he support the plan? Madam Deputy Speaker, he clearly hasn't read it. Annex A, Annex A says on top, on top of the 140 million he's already showered on Rwanda, when we send people there under this treaty, we have to pay for their accommodation oh. and their upkeep exactly. for five years. Oh. And that's not all. This morning, a government minister admitted that anyone we send to Rwanda who commits a crime can be returned to us. Yeah. I'm beginning to see why the Home Secretary said the Rwanda scheme it's something to do with bats, I think, was it? Yeah. <laughs> what does. What does he first think attracted Mr Kagame to hundreds of millions of pounds for nothing in return? Yeah. 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 I've slightly lost the thread of the question, Madam Deputy Speaker, but the, the simple point is, the simple point, the, the simple point is, there's a simple question here. If you believe in stopping the boats, as we on this side of the House do, you need to have an effective deterrence and returns agreement. It's as simple as that. The Honourable Gentleman is not interested in stopping the boats, which is why he's not interested in the Rwanda plan. In fact, Madam Deputy Speaker, in fact, we know that they don't want to tackle this issue because even when, even when this government was trying to deport foreign national offenders out of this country, they opposed it. Multiple members of his shadow front bench all signed a letter to me to that effect. But I don't need to tell him that because he signed it too. OK, that's, that's enough. <laughs> Sir Keir Starmer. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would say that this treaty has got more holes in than the Swiss cheese, but I don't want to wind up the Prime Minister by talking about a European country again. Madam Deputy Speaker, you have to give credit to the Rwandan government. They saw this Prime Minister coming a mile off. You can only imagine their delight, their sheer disbelief 
when having already banked £140 million of British taxpayer money without housing a single asylum seeker, the Prime Minister appears again with another offer they can't refuse, a gimmick that will send taxpayers' money to Rwanda, refugees from Rwanda to Britain, and won't stop the boats. It was mentioned of Margaret Thatcher earlier. Understandable excitement about the mention of the name. But the House must listen to the Leader of the Opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. Are to go from up yours to laws to take our money, Kigami. Mr Speaker. I do. Well, Ma- Madam Deputy Speaker, I, 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 when, it comes, when it comes to this European thing and Margaret Thatcher, this is, this is the week that the Shadow Foreign Secretary, I think, didn't rule out rejoining the European Union. And that, he can role play Margaret Thatcher all he wants, but when it comes to Europe, his answer is the same yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. Forget the private jet. He's he's obviously on a private planet of his own. (laughs) But as we Daily Mail readers learnt this week that the Prime Minister has begun to feel sorry for himself. He's even been heard comparing his plight to his beloved Southampton Football Club. I do think that's a bit harsh because Saints have been on an 11-game unbeaten run. While, as the song has it, the Prime Minister gets battered everywhere he goes. But if you want the perfect example of how badly the Tories have broken the asylum system, last week the Home Office admitted that 17,000 people in the asylum system. Order! Order! Come on! Uh, Sir Keir Starmer. Thank you. If you want the perfect example of how badly they've broken the asylum system, Madam Deputy Speaker, last week the Home Office admitted that 17,000 people in the asylum system have disappeared. Their exact words, it's hard to believe this, we don't think we know where all these people are. Now, you might lose your car keys, you might lose your headphones, you might lose your marbles. How do you lose 17,000 people? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I mean, on, on the topic of football teams, he, lost, de- he used to describe interest, Ru- this Rwanda policy as immoral, and yet his football team has a Visit Rwanda badge <laughs> on the side of them. But I like, in, the meet, in, the week, in, in the week when he made his big economy speech, we're still waiting to hear how he's going to borrow £28 billion pounds and still cut taxes and reduce debt. It's the same old thing. The sums don't add up. But while they're struggling with their calculator, we're getting on and delivering. A new treaty with Rwanda, the toughest Asia measures to cut legal migration, our schools marching up the tables and tax cuts for millions, Madam Deputy Speaker. So whether it's controlling our borders or lowering our taxes, just like the Saints, the Conservatives are marching on. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm getting fed up with sitting in traffic jams in my constituency caused by contractors digging up roads, involving lane closures and temporary traffic lights, often invoking utility company emergency powers that turn out not to be emergencies, and often with no sign of anybody doing any work, particularly over weekends. So I set up a campaign to name and shame these inconsiderate contractors. But it turns out that when they cause all this chaos, when they breach the rules of their permit, the maximum penalty is an £80 fixed penalty notice. So will the Prime Minister back my campaign and support better enforcement and realistic levels of fines? Well, my honourable friend makes an excellent point, and that's why we've set aside £8 billion as a result of our 
plans on HS2, Madam Deputy Speaker, which is enough to resurface over 5,000 miles of road to improve journeys, a cornerstone of our plan. But also, we are introducing a range of measures, as the Honourable Gentleman says, to reduce congestion from roadworks. Contained in the plan for drivers is a scheme for greater fines and penalties to ensure that works do finish on time. And I'll make sure that we look at his suggestion and I wholeheartedly back his campaign. The leader of the Scottish Nationalists, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Is the Prime Minister worried that he is projected to be the first Conservative Party leader to lose a general election to a fellow Thatcherite? hear the Prime Minister and we've got a lot of questions to get through. It's, it's not the Prime Minister's opponents who are giving him trouble. Prime Minister! Ma 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 Madam Deputy Speaker, I say to the Honourable Gentleman, Margaret Thatcher's view was cut inflation, then cut taxes and then win an election and that's very much my plan. Of, of course, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's not just in relation to Margaret Thatcher where the Tory and Labour leader appear to agree. The same is true of the government's latest migration policies. Now, for those of us on these benches, we aren't afraid to say that we believe migration is a good thing. Yeah. It, enriches, it enriches our communities, it enriches our economy, it enriches our universities, our schools, our health service and, of course, our care sector. So in that regard, can I ask the Prime Minister, why does he think it is acceptable to ask people to come to these shores to care for our family members whilst we show complete disregard for theirs? What has become of this place? Madam Speaker, it's completely wrong. No, as we've already said, we have a proud track record of welcoming those who are most vulnerable around the world. Over half a million over the past few years from Syria, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Hong Kong and elsewhere. And that's what this country will always do. But at the same time, when it comes to economic migration and other forms, it's absolutely right that we take strong action to curb the levels that we have seen because they are simply far too high and place unsustainable pressure on our public services. And, Madam Speaker, I make no apology for saying that or indeed saying that it is important that those who come here contribute to our public services. Chris Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all welcome the Government's significant funding in increase for two-year-olds preschooling in 2023? 20, 24 but minutes 20, after 20, 12, um, and PMQ's reaches uh, conclusion again. I'll just run through some of your thoughts on it, and, um, and then we'll talk to Natasha about, about hers. Uh, I did think that, actually, James, in Tunbridge Wells. You spoke, they listened. The Cones hotline is back. What a question. Obviously, nothing else going on. That question, James, in Tunbridge Wells, as you well know, is, is, is a gimme. Quite a few of you picking up on that. I resurrected the ghost of the Cones hotline yesterday. And um, whoever that obscure backbencher was complaining to uh, Rishi Sunak about traffic jam seems to have brought it back into, into play again today. Ian in Wolverhampton also picking up on that. Um, let's have a look. Uh, I just threw coffee everywhere, laughing at Sunak's plan, writes Joe, to win the election. Yet more mess from this Tory government. A bit of bants while the country crashes and burns. Brilliant. Starmer missed an open goal there with things you may lose. He should have mentioned an Oyster card. Reference there to Susan Hall, one of the most harrowing victims of crime that this country has ever <laughs> witnessed. Uh, I didn't think it was possible, says Ian in Brentford, but Starmer was even better this week. Forensic and cutting. Sunak was pathetic. Sunak and his Tory cronies were an absolute joke and unfortunately none of us are laughing that's the end of my highbrow analysis uh, i'm fairly sure i'm right about this says gus but i don't think i've heard it commented on sunak appears to forget each week that starmer is right honorable not just honorable i don't is that true is that is he right honorable yes, the, yeah, he I, I heard him say right honorable but maybe he, he uh, uh, gary and darlington says sunak's like john major but without the charisma which I think is a comment that works on several levels. And Matt picking up on something that I'm inclined to agree with. Sunak looks like he's had enough of the whole situation. Um, he seems to be defeated. 
And Sunak looks more like Pitt the Younger from Blackadder every week, says Guy in Torquay. Uh, quite a few people picking up on the Cones hotline as well. Love the show, James, but PMQs has become an embarrassing part of our government. These are supposed to be our brightest and best. I can't believe the behaviour. Other countries must think we are beyond saving. You'd be surprised, actually. I forget what country it was in, but they're, they're routinely actual fist fights in some, uh, in some parliaments. Natasha Clark, LBC's political editor, is with me. He he went in hard on on Rwanda and uh, and he went in quite effectively. Really. He did. He was really good. I think uh, another stunning um, outing for Sakir Starmer there, wasn't it? Um, mm. You said it wasn't going to be better than last week. I think it was. Do you? Because no, I said it might be. You said it wasn't. Be. No, I said How it wouldn't be. How dare you rewrite history? No, no, I said you said that, right. uh, that it was going to be oh, better, so that it, it could be, be better, yes, and it was. So Fantastic. I'm just telling you that you're right. I we'll thought you might appreciate that. that. we we'll get used to that. I thought it was better than last week. Uh, his strategy of really making lots of terrible dad jokes, but actually it does work, um, and then intersecting that with some quite dissecting... Uh, of this Rwanda yes. plan, really ripping it to pieces um, and kind of not focusing on the overall overarching theme of migration, but just going forensically in on this is why it's rubbish. This is why it doesn't work. This is how much money it's going to cost. Uh, I think that really worked for him today. Staying away from the moral dimension of it as well, which is I mean, almost the essence of Keir Starmer, isn't it? Pragmatism really ahead of anything else because if you stay away from the moral dimension you don't have to really he, apart from Sunak reminding him at the end that he did once call it immoral there's a change in tactic there because now he's just focusing on the inefficacy of it and, and the cost and the small print and the small print is terrible for the Foreign Secretary and for the Prime Minister up to and including a senior Rwandan politician on the telly yesterday I think talking to ITV News talking to um, Paul Brand saying there's nothing in the there's nothing in the new document that wasn't in the old one sure there's there's a lot of good detail in there that we um we did go through yesterday which is now getting ripped apart uh, yes. however including the idea that criminals we were told yesterday on a home office briefing <laughs> will be taken back to so the if you, uk if you get deported to rwanda and commit a crime you go get to jail for five years UK. you can get brought back to the uk afterwards and then redeported somewhere else apparently after that yeah that so, was chris philp who, yeah it's fair to say got into knots doesn't, in that. doesn't really cover himself in glory whenever he steps outside no but yes i think uh, it makes it easy for keir starmer doesn't it when when these de these deals are so full of holes we're taking uh, some migrants back from rwanda as well according to the deal uh, that rishi sunak and and the the rwanda government signed uh, just yesterday, um, there's there's lots to go on, isn't there? That you know, we, 140 million pounds we've spent on this partnership. Yeah. We know there's going to be spent more money. James Cleverly did admit yesterday that more money is going to be spent uh, sending it to Rwanda to prop up the details for this treaty. We don't know how much yet. They're being very tight-lipped about it, but yes, more money being thrown away. Uh, possibly down the drain for a system that might never get up and running ever again. That's the money that's gone to Paul Gagami's regime, of course. But P Peter Gagan, who um, uh, uh, applies his trade now l largely independently, I really heartily recommend his Democracy for Sale sub-stack, previously, of course, at Open Democracy. Peter's put in an FOI, I think, on some of the costs. So they might have sent 140 million quid to Rwanda itself, but they spent 2.1 million pounds fighting legal challenges to the policy here at home. Last month's doomed Supreme Court case alone cost almost 300,000 pounds. So there's plenty of money around... Um, uh, Think when, about how many tax cuts that could have How many paid nurses, for? Natasha? How nurses, many teachers? How many nurses that, that could have paid for? Someone will be doing the calculation as we speak. Um, does the Europe stuff work? Because it was I tell you, that was an interesting moment. So he didn't reach for the emergency Corbyn button, obviously, and he hasn't now for three weeks, four weeks, by my reckoning. I think right. So I think they've established that doesn't work anymore. It probably does him more harm than good because all Starmer has to do is stand up and say, <laughs> I threw him out of the party. He's not here anymore, mate. He's not here anymore. But he does still think that by by saying, ooh, Europe, that might cause Starmer problems. But Starmer came back on that with his, probably his weakest joke, actually, about Swiss cheese and not wanting to upset the Prime Minister by mentioning a European country. I don't know that, it, 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 that there's any toxicity attached anymore to Rishi Sunak suggesting that Keir Starmer feels rather more warm towards Europe than Rishi Sunak does. I think there is a bit, and there, is, there is a bit of... Keir Starmer is the guy that campaigned and the laugh under Jeremy Corbyn for us, uh, you know, to, to have a closer relationship with the EU and to rejoin it. And that's the yeah. that's the guy. And it, does he still hold those views or not? And those are legitimate questions that people will be asking 
of Sakir Starmer uh, ahead of the next election. So I think the Tories obviously have very few emergency buttons to push, and that is one of them. Yeah, and it's a, it's a weak one, even if it's mildly effective. Final question, and we need to be brief. I've just noticed the time. What, what's happened the last two weeks, do you think? Has Starmer got new people around him? Has he changed his diet? He's is clearly it, stepped he, up, hasn't he? He's had yes, his Weetabix yes. and uh, he's, you know, more dad jokes preparing me ready for Christmas. But, like, it's working, <laughs> isn't it? I think all of them are ready, ready for, for a bit of a break. There's lots of raucous shouting across the chamber. Yeah. Elena Lang telling everyone to calm down a bit. I but prefer yes. her to Lindsay Hoyle. I think she does. I, 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 I don't want to hear too much of the speaker or the deputy speaker at PMQs and she, she I think, does a does a bang-up job. But do we know? Has he got new people with him? Or I do know. Yeah, there are a few people that I do know that have moved into Sakir Starmer's team recently, so I'm definitely going to be messaging them and saying, well done. Um, the PMQs are sounding a lot better. But yes, not sure on that one, but it does seem like he's sharpened up his act. He's really going on stuff that he knows is very forensic uh, and peppering a couple of good jokes in for good measure. Natasha Clark, many thanks indeed. I'm um, going to talk to Ruth, uh, well we're going to talk to Brenda Doherty after the news whose mum was the first woman to die with Covid in Northern Ireland. She now co-leads the Northern Ireland branch of the Covid-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group and after we've met Brenda we will probably be catching up with what's unfolded at that inquiry during that evidence from Boris Johnson while we have been concerning ourselves with the current Prime Minister's weekly questions. But before all of that, Lottie Morley has your head. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.36 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The um, earlier uh, moments of Boris Johnson's testimony somewhat disrupted by uh, uh, members of the bereaved COVID families group standing up, making a silent protest. I, I'm not sure that Lady Hale had much choice but to order their removal, but it was, a, it was a very mannered and silent protest, simply involving holding up pieces of paper which collectively read that the, that the dead can't hear your apologies. Um, it's a very poignant phrase, one that no doubt resonated with Brenda Doherty, whose mum, Ruth Burke, was 82 years old when she became... One of the first people, I think the first woman to die with COVID in Northern Ireland. And uh, Brenda now leads the Northern Ireland branch of the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group. Um, Brenda, I think you've been watching events here, here in London with other members of your group. Let, let, let's begin with what you were hoping to see during the first hours of Boris Johnson's testimony. And then we'll wonder whether you've seen it. Hi, James. Can I just I just want to make a wee correction there. Just that actually it was the Friends of the Wall that stood up with the band. Indeed it was. No, you're absolutely the, right. You're absolutely uh, right. They're volunteers and they're the ones who um, uh, stood up today Thank with their, their posters. Yes, so I've been, I've been watching um, quite frustratingly, actually, the um, inquiry today. I haven't heard Mr Johnson take ownership of any real feelings other than the fact that he probably didn't coordinate uh, well with the devolved administrations, which, you know, as being somebody who lives in the devolved administration, I know mm. that anyway. But, um, you know, the apology that he could give, that he gave, should I say, at this moment in time means nothing to me. I want to hear over the next two days, does he actually take ownership of the, the mistakes that... Um, he as the leader, as well as some of his government advisers, have made. I wonder whether he's even going to acknowledge that they were actual mistakes, uh, as opposed to inevitable consequences of the urgency of the situation or some such phrase that he'll no doubt come out with. Well, no doubt he probably will come out of something like that. I mean, one of the questions he was asked this morning, I was a bit flabbergasted when I heard his response, because mm. what he said was, was, was so far as I paid attention, <laughs> now, you know, I just think that's scandalous. Yeah. Um, I don't have a job like Mr. Johnson, but my job's a very responsible one. And I certainly pay attention to anything that is brought to me that is going to affect the families that I work with. So I, I just couldn't believe that he actually uttered that sentence. That could have been actually a case of when his brain wasn't in gear, but his mouth opened, which unfortunately I think happens quite regularly with Mr. Johnson. Uh, and, and possibly saying things, as you suggest, out loud that he would, if he was normal, he'd later regret saying, but him being him, he'll, he'll either gloss over it or pretend that he never said it in the first place. Um, I, I, I'm going to phrase this question carefully, uh, uh, Brenda, because... I don't want to come across as insensitive, but but I'm not. There's not nothing can bring your mum back, can it? 
So what are, what are you looking for from the inquiry in general and Johnson in particular? Well, first of all, I'll answer this. What we need from Mr. Johnson is candor. Hmm. And it's a bit unfortunate that the Liverpool law wasn't passed because that would have been an opportunity to make sure that candor happened. Just remind uh, my listeners not, what element of the Hillsborough law it would be that... that um, you know, the open, the open, uh, the automatic that we wouldn't have to campaign for an yeah, inquiry, yeah. that, you know, the honesty and openness would be there. So that that would be vital. And, you know, you're right. My, my mum's gone. Um, we will never have those final 12 hours that mummy had on her own. You know, Mr. Johnson made his lockdown speech. I got a phone call to say that mummy was going to die. I don't want anybody ever to be in that position again. I don't want people to be locked out of care homes for months on end. They have to stand out in the rain. So this is about learning lessons to save lives. That's what we've always said from the start of the campaign. Learn lessons to save lives. And people will talk about the cost of the campaign, but I'm afraid the human cost that we paid can't happen again. There was unfortunately money misspent, which I'm sure will come out in future modules. And that will also be something that needs to be addressed so that when we do, and we will have a pandemic in the future, mm. that we are far better prepared. So it's about, I want my mum's, I didn't know anything about 1918, so I didn't, the Spanish flu. I want to make sure that future generations know that we did our utmost to make sure that lessons were learned from this pandemic. You seem to be more concerned by the preparation for future pandemics than perhaps even the, the current government is. Well, that's because um, the current government, there is a toxicity, which has been referred to by most witnesses, which is very, very, I mean, I suppose I walked around uh, in my normal life before pre-pandemic in a bubble. Mm. That bubble was well and truly burst in March 2020. Right. I've had to read things like the Civil Contingency Act. I'm finding out that, you know, civil servants were removed from preparing for a pandemic to go on to uh, a Brexit, no deal Brexit. These are things that I never thought I would need to know. And one of the big things that really concerns me is how we can have leaders who think it's okay. I mean, Mr. Johnson, again, referred to some of the WhatsApp messages as being sort of normal. Yes. I, I'm afraid if anybody sent WhatsApp messages like that where I'm employed, <laughs> there would be a disciplinary and investigation and sacked. That's a very good point, you know. And, and also, presumably, where you work, the most senior people in the organisation routinely lose 5,000 messages without knowing where they've ended up or whether they can ever be retrieved. Oh, I'm actually wondering, is Mr. Uh, Johnson menopausal? <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I am, but I, I, I have never done anything that, that, that is that tragic. No, I'm sorry, that wasn't even a good cover up. Mm. You know, uh, I'm afraid. Um, and this is this is the problem that I have with Mr. Johnson. And I'm really nice calling him Mr. Johnson. Yes. Um, I think that he does a lot of waffling. And unfortunately, sometimes that takes away from the actual subject and the questions that he's being asked, and then we don't get to answers. So what I need from the inquiry and what I need from Mr. Keith is to keep pushing him and not let him off and not let him bumble. This is an opportunity for us to actually get to the bottom of it. And one of the things I want to be very clear about, yes, this is not about the personalities in the government. And I think somewhere along the line, we can get lost in that. Mm. But I think what it is, what it does show is that the personalities that you have in government impacts on the decision making. Clearly. And I think that's what's got lost during uh, the whole management of the pandemic. Um, I, just to step back from today's events, you, you've obviously been following events in general very closely, the whole inquiry very closely. I, I, I mean, what words would you use to describe your thoughts at the moment? Are you encouraged by the direction of traffic, by what's come out so far, by the way that the inquiry has been conducted? Well, there, there's sort of twofold. Hmm. One, um, yes, you know, I, I'm really glad that um, Lady Hallett pushed for the WhatsApps. And I do believe that, you know, on one level, she is, she is in a very difficult position she's not going to be pleasing all the people all the time for sure. but the thing for us as a Cambrian group I mean I've had the privilege of being at the inquiry I have had the privilege of telling my mum's story and that would be the direction I would like to see I would like to see more core participants called 
to give evidence because that's what brings the human cost. You know, the human cost of those who've lost their lives, the human cost to those who are still suffering from long COVID, which Mr. Johnson dismissed. Yes, he did. You know, um, and unfortunately, uh, I think the thing is to that over years to come, people who have had COVID and are suffering consequences, you know, their health is going to deteriorate. Mm. And these are the sorts of people that unfortunately under Mr. Johnson's lead were left very vulnerable. And and the sorts of people that under Mr. Sunak's lead are being increasingly sort of shouted at to, to return to work. Before you go, Brett, I, I wasn't expecting you to bring up Spanish flu. And and you certainly wouldn't have been expecting the question I'm about to ask you. But my, my colleague Lewis Goodall has been looking at this and looking at how across the world, in a way, there was a sense of the population wanting to move on as quickly as possible. And that entails not learning lessons, not perhaps taking the lessons from the, the, the 1918 pandemic and using them to prepare for the next one. How, how do we guard against that happening now? Because you clearly do not suffer from the, the, the desire to move on and file it all away and leave the trauma somewhere in a box. You're, you're clear-eyed about the need to learn these lessons. How, how do we spread that sense? I, I think one of the things is we have to make sure that history reflects the reality of COVID. And mm. I, I think that is... Uh, very important. So we need to look at education. I mean, I'm involved with another project here in Northern Ireland called Memory Stones of Love. And one of the things that we are doing at this moment in time is looking at how we can ensure that people's um, stories are and experiences are told and that they are then included some way in the curriculum. You know, myself and my co-founder were, are hoping to go round and be part of the education. We've linked in with Carew's Bereavement Services and I think that's what's vital. It's important. I know people want to move on. Yeah. The thing is, I will never move on. I will move forward. My mummy will always be with me in my heart. Uh, she's my driving force. That's why I'm here. She was a feisty wee woman. I'm her daughter. But I, I think the thing is, too, we have to realise that in order to help us to move forward, we need to see changes being made. We need to see that society is not left vulnerable the way they were in 2020 yes i hope you'll allow me to say that your mum would be very proud of you brenda now don't you make me cry i have to go and do a tv <laughs> i yeah my mum we were the babes is what we called her and she was are we my mummy lost her son when she was 26 uh, when he was 16 in 1984 and she showed us the value of life so that's why i'm here because i value life well thank you for showing us Brenda Thank Doherty. you very much for having me on. Thank you. God bless and good luck to you as well. In Thank all you that, very much. In all that you're doing. It's 12.47. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Mentioned earlier the question from Hugo Keith Casey about uh, Boris Johnson's failure to attend Cobra meetings. There's going to be a lot to pick over and we won't have spotted all of it in the first instance. Charlotte Lynch will have been paying more attention than we have. But I think it is worth... Just having a little listen to this. Didn't the seriousness uh, of the position in, in late January make itself plain to you? How could there have been a need for a COBRA every week for five weeks in relation to an issue that didn't require your direct involvement as the Prime Minister? I think for the reason you've, you've given, which is uh, that a, a COBRA is a, a, a regular occurrence in, in government when there's something that a, uh, a particular government department is leading on. In this case, it was uh, it health. The possibility of a coronavirus pandemic, which was only declared by, by the WHO on the 12th of, of March, was, was not something that had yet been, uh, hadn't really broken upon the political world, certainly in my consciousness as something of a uh, real potential, you know, a real potential national disaster. Did and, you? And, you know, it, it, in that period, end of January, beginning of February, it's, it's end of January, beginning of February, it's, it's not much in the political world. I wasn't asked about it, for instance, at all at PMQs. Is that true? I wasn't asked because I know Labour, as, as, as long ago as April of 2020, were accusing him of being missing in action during the crucial weeks when the virus first arrived in the UK. 
Michael Gove sent out to um, to repel the story, but it was on Sophie Ridge's Sunday show on Sky News that he conceded Johnson had indeed missed five meetings of the government's Cobra Emergency Committee. Charlotte Lynch has joined me. Essentially trying there to claim that not attending Cobra meetings, five consecutive Cobra meetings at the at the outset of the pandemic or what became the pandemic was just normal behaviour, business as usual. He just wasn't asked about it at PMQs, yeah. so it didn't really cross his mind. I think the premise of, of that question, though, from, from Hugo I Keith think, Casey I think was... Khan was asking us about it on this mm. programme at the time, actually, because yeah. he wasn't invited either. And he was, yeah, he was making the case that he, he should have been. Mm. And again, you know, that the very fact that five Cobra meetings were held, one a week, mm. uh, over the space of five weeks. That was the premise of the question of uh, from, from Hugo Keith KC, essentially saying, did, did it not alarm you that actually such a, an amount of, of Cobra meetings were, were being held about this thing that you just didn't uh, attend? Um, in fact, it, it was up until the 26th of February. There was one held on the 26th of February that, that the Prime Minister uh, didn't attend uh, either. Um, and he told the inquiry that he just didn't twig and, and he should have twigged much sooner uh, about how serious uh, COVID was. He accepted and, and he's repeatedly accepted that his mindset in, he said, January to, to mid-February, but um, it appears what's being argued and presented to him in evidence is actually right up until the end of February. Um, he was not as alarmed uh, as he should have been. He hadn't woken up mm. uh, to the threat that this virus w was posing. Now, he said he began to realise after seeing footage from Italy, he said uh, that it rattled him. Um, but more messages were, were put to him about, you know, what to what extent really uh, that that did uh, wake him up or, or what threat he was seeing uh, because there were some messages present, presented to him that had been sent from, from Dominic Cummings uh, in a WhatsApp group uh, with him and Sir Edward Lister who was the Downing Street Chief of Staff at the time uh, where Dominic Cummings said on the 6th of February, uh, we need a briefing on COBRA tomorrow uh, he was told it was probably out of control already and would sweep the world. Now he called it a major comms exercise emphasis on comms mm. rather than health right. and Sir Edward Lister who was the Downing Street Chief of Staff said uh, Dom is right, the comms is key. Uh, Boris Johnson responded to that by saying uh, yes we need to talk coronavirus comms at nine. So Hugo Keith KC uh, then went in with questioning about the type of threat that he was most concerned about. Why was there a focus by way of the singular response to that information on comms. Why didn't any of you say, well, if this virus is probably out of control now and will sweep the world, why did none of you say, we need to take steps now to deal with infection control, prevent the spread, alert the population? We have a major problem, not focusing on communications. Because I think that the... Um, <laughs> your, it's your it's your your point about the infection rate, fatality rate, uh, the the consequences. I think that when you read that a an Asiatic pandemic is is about to to sweep the world, uh, you you you're, you in, you think you've heard it before, and that was the that was the problem, and uh, so I say we need to we need to talk about it. But I think it would be fair to say that the, the, the scientific community within Whitehall at that stage uh, was not telling us that I was not being informed that this was something that was going to um, uh, require urgent and immediate action. But and, you knew... And I think that... Um, I think that... The, the, although although you're, you're right that we could, we could see the mathematical implications of the reasonable worth case scenario, I think the problem was that we didn't think, and this was our mistake, we didn't think that the RWCS was very likely to happen. That was the problem. Now, we know that Boris Johnson then did chair his first COBRA meeting relating to COVID on the 3rd of March, that 2020. That was, big, that was very big of him. I think we can all agree. Well done, mm. Boris, turning up for a COBRA meeting. I hope someone gave him a biscuit. Yeah, that was 3rd of March, 2020. But we know there was... Um, a, a cabinet meeting on the 28th of February, uh, where again he was, uh, they went down a similar line of, of questioning because, um, again, rather than 
talking about the, the health threats of the virus, it seemed that Boris Johnson w- was warning of, of the dangers of, of overreaction. Strategy. When are we going to take big decisions of what evidence, on what evidence, of what evidence, and then you say biggest damage done by overreaction? So it looks from the face of this note that your, your sense that there was a real crisis, that you were extremely rattled, is, is prevalent in the first sentence. But in the second sentence, perhaps in reflection of the CCS report, you say the biggest damage is done by overreaction. I, I, think, I think I'm leaving both possibilities open um, because that's how it's, it, still, it still struck me. Um, I think that, that in, in disasters such as this, the, the, the actions that government take inevitably also have have costs, and, and I'm sure we're going to come on to this, but that, that's the balance you have to strike. As the Prime Minister, instead of directing government to respond to the threat of a, a near existential crisis, you instead warned of the dangers of over No, I say, no, 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 that's, well, forgive me. Um, I say, when are we going to take some decisions and on what evidence? Because I, I, I'm, I'm looking at a problem that's been presented to me. Um, I need to know what the plan is going to be. I, I've told you that I don't like the look of the way it's going in Italy at all. And we need to do something. It's nearly one o'clock. I can't take any more. Luckily, Sheila Fogarty is going to take over now, although Charlotte Lynch has to return, no doubt, to this particularly oh. pungent cold. For you. It's, 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 called a, it's called a microphone, Shields. What is wrong with me lately? It's a talking I've been into. Microphones. What it's not is a punch bag. <laughs> Headbutting a them. little mini punch bag. Yeah. Uh, you can catch up on all of today's show, yada yada boom, on Global Player. You're always in control. Download it for free from globalplayer.com. Tom Swarbrick <laughs> with you at four. <laughs> Sheila Fogarty with that, you now. That last one was deliberate. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, James. James O'Brien on LBC.